York City, I'm Shauna Smith, along investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. I know we say it every day, but we really do have a busy show for you here today. One key theme that we're diving into, it's the travel economy. Consumers are still spending on flights thanks to demand and leisure travel, but Boeing setbacks continue with the FAA halting production of its 737 MAX aircrafts following the Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 in air door plug blowout. We're going to break down which airlines are best position to navigate some of Boeing's issues. And that's far from all here. We're also taking a look at Tesla this morning. It's moving the market. Look at shares selling off, off just about 8% here in the pre-market after warning of, quote, notably slower production growth this year. It also missed on earnings. So it's a larger correction ahead. We're going to break it all down. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal, Jared Blickery, and Josh Schaefer have more. Hey, Shana. Yeah, like you said, Tesla shares losing some charge this morning. Shares down nearly 10% in pre-market trading. Despite Elon Musk hyping new products on the earnings call, the results shocked Wall Street with the EV maker delivering a soft quarter and weak outlook. We'll look at three reasons why a Tesla correction may be coming just around the bend. And not yet clear for takeoff, Boeing setbacks continue with the FAA halting production of its 737 MAX aircraft following the Alaska Airlines 737-9 MAX in-air door plug blowout. Now, shares of Boeing are down more than 2% today, weighing on the Dow. Alaska Airlines says the groundings will cost $150 million. And elsewhere, industry competitor Southwest, they're reporting mixed earnings amid a brewing fight with flight attendants. And stock futures trading mixed this morning as investors digest the latest read on the U.S. economy. The Bureau of Economic Analysis's advanced estimate of fourth quarter U.S. gross domestic product showing the economy grew at an annualized pace of 3.3% during the period. We'll analyze what that strong print means for Fed rate cut decisions. Well, good morning, everyone. We're taking a look at stock futures here as we are about 28 minutes away from the start of today's trading activity here in the U.S. Take a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. It's been a record-setting week here, no doubt. But we're going to continue to monitor this, of course, going into the start of today's trading activity for you. As we get closer to the opening cross, all major averages higher by a fraction of a percent for the Dow, two-tenths of a percent. S&P 500, four-tenths of a percent. We'll round that off to about half a percent for the NASDAQ 100. Also, taking a quick check on treasuries. You've got the 5, the 10, and the 30-year up on your screen. Right now, you're seeing the 5 sit at about 4.05 percent. And then the 10-year, that's lower by about eight-tenths of a percent. So we're down across the board right now 30 year down by about one percent here sitting at 4.37 and brother certainly lots of trending tickers that we are going to be breaking down here at yahoo finance today tesla we've talked about the massive sell-off that we're seeing in the pre-market also ibm boeing humana and paramount all on the move we got the latest for you here as we break down today's market action but first our top story stock futures they are trading higher this morning at least across the equities markets major averages here as investors digest the latest read on the u.s economy gdp for the final quarter of 2023 yahoo finances josh schaefer has got the numbers here for us hey josh hey brad so yeah when you take a look at this gdp release that we got this morning you'll see the u.s economy grew at an annualized rate of 3.3 percent in the fourth quarter economists had expected 2%. So a pretty big beat here, of course, if you've been following economic data releases in 2023, not necessarily a surprise to some of us, it's been beating consistently. But really what you see here when you take a look at this chart is how strong the economy was throughout 2023. Uh, the annualized rate, the early reading here for the annualized growth rate for the economy in 2023 comes in at 2.5%. That's a mark up from 1.9% that we saw in 2022. But the key thing here and the biggest takeaway from this release is we also get PCE inflation data within this, within this release, guys. And I think several economists already out highlighting, if you take a look at what that shows us, we're looking at about a 2% target, it being at the Fed's 2% target for the fourth quarter. Uh, Mark Zandi over at Moody's out highlighting on X today, he said, the, we're right at the Fed's target, strong growth and low inflation feels very good. And so when we think about this combo here, this is kind of your soft landing combo. Inflation coming down, growth still good, 
that means the economy might be able to survive this if we keep this trend going. Because remember, a lot of economists pointing out now, the Fed is going to cut or should be cutting for their view, because inflation is coming down, right? And we're seeing that in this release. Inflation coming down, economy still growing. Positive outlook, guys. Positive outlook on a Thursday. I we like that. We will see. All right, I know. But you know what's interesting to me? I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that we're not seeing a more of a reaction in the futures market here this morning. You would think when you get a number that is that strong, the implications and that then what that could mean here for the Fed, you would think we would see a little bit of pressure across the board. But like you were pointing to, and like we've been talking about all week, talk about the fact that they're also weighing some of these results that we're getting out here from earnings. And at least right now, it seems like enough here in order to counter some of those fears. Yeah, I mean, overall, Shauna, I think when you take a look at specifically PCE over the last six months, this is a conversation you're gonna hear a lot. We get the PCE for December coming out tomorrow morning, right? Yeah. A lot of economists highlighting that six-month annualized PCE that's basically flat. Yeah. Like we're talking about inflation in we when we look at the last six months, it's been very, very good. Mm -hmm. And at some point, people just think the Fed is going to have to come down from that restricted level because if they don't, then that's when you're going to start seeing issues. So I think it's honestly maybe more of an inflation story mm -hmm. than a hot economic data story as far as what we're getting from market reaction. Yeah, well. exactly. And the fact that this is so uh, backward looking. All right, Josh, yeah. thanks so much. All right, let's get to one of our biggest trending tickers of the day, and that is Tesla. Shares selling off ahead of the open on worries about lackluster demand and also the weak results that we got out after the bell yesterday. Well, on the earnings call last night, CEO Elon Musk blaming higher rates for those sluggish sales. Let's take a listen. It's not that people don't want. We have tons of, the, the, we have lots of people who want to buy our car, but simply cannot afford it. As interest rates drop and that monthly payment drops, then they're able to afford it and they buy the car. It's pretty straightforward. So we're looking at shares under pressure here ahead of the open. Year to date, this is a stock that's already been under pressure off just about 16%. So what's ahead? Let's talk about it. We've got a couple of two analysts, I should say, to break all this down for you. We want to bring in Tashi Kini, ARC Invest Director of Investment Analysis and Institutional Strategies. We've also got Dan Ives, Webb Bush Managing Director, also Senior Equity Research Analyst. Great to have both of you. Dan, let me start with you because your reaction, the note that you sent out here this morning, caught our attention in terms of some of the issues that you are raising on the heels of these results. And you were talking about the fact that you wrongly expected that adults were going to be in the room on the call. You took issue with some of the things that were said during the call. How has maybe what you've heard over the last 12 hours changed your short-term outlook here on Tesla? Look, you need communication. What the margin guidance is ultimately going to be, how many more price cuts. And, and I think that's the frustration. At a time that investors need adults in the room, it felt more like preschool. And I think that was a conference call you're going to see pressure on the stock. The long-term story doesn't change, and Tasha, will, I'm sure you agree. But in the near term, the bears win. I'll put this question to both of you, Dan, just because you know you brought this up a moment ago, and we mentioned this in the intro. Is it as simple as interest rates not being in Tesla's favor, or is there something else at play within the broader EV demand landscape? I'll go to you, Dan, first, and then I'll get your thoughts, Tasha. Look, demand overall has actually been pretty strong relative to, you know, if you think about how bad it could have been, 35% plus growth, call it 18, 20% this year for 24. The, the reason the stock's down, it's because of margins. And I think 80% of the reason the stock's down is communication, 20% results. Tasha, I want to get your thoughts on that as well. And I'll layer on perhaps this additive a new model, is that really going to spur demand the way that some investors were hoping for or might have anticipated? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Dan, Dan said it, right? Um, I, I think that the focus should be on the long term here. And a, a lot of investors currently right now are focused on the short term. Hey, look, you know, Tesla's not immune to changes in interest rates, right? But when you look at the auto industry as a whole, um, they are, you know, one of the only electric vehicle manufacturers that has this profitability. And we heard on the call that they're able to reduce costs at really an unprecedented rate. You know, when analyst thinks it's over 10% a year. And they said they see further opportunity for cost reduction. So, I mean, they've cemented their lead in electric vehicles. I think if, if you want to talk about the next year or so, I mean, we should be talking about robo taxis, right? We heard that 
um, full self-driving version 12, their latest uh, version of autonomous driving software is going to roll out to more customers in North America soon. I think that shows confidence in their autonomous capability. And as you know, we think that's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. We also heard that Optimus um, might ship next year. I mean, general purpose robots for manufacturing alone, we think could be a, a $10 trillion market as a whole. Mm. Um, so we're really excited for those AI opportunities. This is one of the greatest AI stories of our time. And Tasha, you've been a long-term uh, bull here on Tesla. But Dan, let's talk about what is going to happen here over the next one or two years. Because 2024, it looks like from the commentary there, it's going to set up to be a very challenging year or challenging year, I should say, for Tesla. Is 2025, is that going to look much better? Look, I mean, and, and I think, Tasha, we agree 100% from an AI perspective that could be multiples of what the stock's worth today from an EV opportunity. But 2024... You need to hold the line on margin. You cannot continue to cut prices. I think th if this is a trough period next few quarters, then, then this is the low. But it comes down to the communication because investors want to hear guidance to sort of navigate this period. When the plane's crashing in the near term, you're not focused on salted or unsalted pretzels. You know, Tasha, when we think about what other auto manufacturers are doing as well right now. I mean, the scale has been there for years. Tesla has obviously been able to ramp up over these past few years, specifically in EVs. A lot of these other manufacturers have had to either pivot some of their ambitions or at least draw back, but they still have considerable scale that, that Tesla perhaps can't turn on the same way. You know, how are some of the other manufacturers, Ford, Stellantis, GM, how's what they're doing perhaps one of the larger kind of clouds that continues to loom over Tesla and the larger demand environment as well. Well, Brad, you said it. Those traditional auto manufacturers are actually pulling back their electrical vehicle plans. And it's again, because they don't have, you know, they don't have the lead that Tesla has. They don't have the cost structure that Tesla has. Um, so yes, they have scale, but not in electric vehicles, right? Some of the Chinese automakers have scale in electric vehicles, but when you look at um, North America, you know, Tesla's been the lead for a long time. And by the way, it's not just about cars, right? It's about AI. It's about compute. Um, and Tesla is years ahead of the competition there. I mean, what they're building out in terms of AI compute is going to rival many tech companies, let alone automakers. Automakers aren't even close. Um, and, and you cannot talk about Tesla without talking about this robotics opportunity. And so to give you an example, right, Tesla has millions of cars on the road. They're, co they're able to access data from over 2 million miles of full self-driving uh, behavior from customers per day. No other automaker can pull that information off of their customer cars. I mean, this is unprecedented, right? So when you think about solving for autonomy, which is the future of the auto market. And if you're not there, I don't even know if you can survive the next five years, 10 years. So I, I think that's where Tesla has this lead. Um, and I think that we, we see videos of these vehicles where people don't have to intervene and it's full drives, right? So it's, it's already possible in, in specific scenarios, you know, California locations. I think that they could launch a ride hail robo taxi service a lot sooner than people expect. And then, you know, the margin fear is over, right? Because it totally changes the business model. This is going to be a lot more profitable than their base vehicle business. All right. We're going to continue to track ultimately when they get to some of those big milestones. I, I thought we would have had autonomous robo-taxis by now already. That's what I was told or sold by Tesla, but uh, we know that there have been some hiccups in the road here. We, we can continue to discuss this all day. We know it's going to be trending throughout the morning and throughout the rest of today's trading session. Tasha and Dan, thanks so much for kicking off today's show with us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Switching gears here, Boeing setbacks continue with the FAA halting production of its 737 MAX aircrafts. The agency did, however, approve an inspection process to allow grounded 737 MAX 9 planes the chance to resume flying if they pass here. So there's a lot to break down here, but with the brief amount of time, taking a look at Boeing shares right now, they're down by about 2.6%. There's even more to this story and how Boeing's manufacturing operations, and again, this is a day where Boeing's going to essentially be shutting down some of those operations for one day so that they can do a quality control type of class and, and testing. And uh, ultimately, we'll see what delta that has on 
at least the mindset for manufacturing within their operations too. Yeah, certainly, Brad, and that's why we're seeing some pressure on the stock here today because we've talked about the fact that Boeing needs to ramp up production in order to, re to reduce its debt loads, in order to achieve some of those growth targets that they have laid out. So the fact that they are not able to follow through on those planned production increases, that is a real a headwind and a real challenge here for the stock, especially given what we have been talking about over the last several weeks. Now, there's no estimate, at least as far as, as what have I seen and what I'm hearing here from analysts in terms of how long this could potentially last for. But putting this in perspective, just how big of a setback this is, we certainly know that the pressure that Boeing has been under, under Dave Calhoun, to get their production in order to make sure that they don't have any sort of manufacturing or any sort of uh, production issues here going forward. Now, it's not entirely clear what exactly happened with this. A lot of this are being uh, faulted in terms of the assembly rather than a design flaw. But when it comes to what this means going forward for future deliveries here for the airlines, you've heard some adjustments on that here this morning on these earnings calls. And then also taking a look at a number of these suppliers that are under pressure as well. Their business is substantially hurt by some of the uh, chaos that's happening right now with Boeing. So we're seeing a real reaction in shares here this morning of a name like Spirit. And then also when you take a look at a name like Howmet, that's off just about one and a half percent. Yeah, you could even look to GE, of course, GE Aerospace, one of the mm -hmm. larger engine manufacturers here in the U.S. has major ties with Boeing as well here. Well, continuing the air conversation, if you will, checking its baggage, Alaska Airlines out with a warning in its earnings report with delays that in with, is, that with delays and deliveries, excuse me, it now projects capacity growth to be at or below the lower end of its previously projected range. The airline company saying the current grounding of the 737 Max 9 will cost them $150 million. For more on the state of airlines, we're joined by Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. Uh, Mike, we've gotten a wave of airline earnings to start off this earnings season. It kicked off with Delta. Ed Bastian told us they don't have, you know, any kind of exposure to the Dash 9, but of course they do have orders for the Dash 10. Uh, we do know that this warning that's come out from Alaska, as well as what United has said, certainly catching investors' attention here. Which of these airlines do you believe is best positioned to maneuver some of the issues that we're seeing coming out of the Boeing MAX 9? Well, being isolated more from the Boeing issue right now is American and also Delta to some degree. But right now today, like, for example, Southwest Airlines, over half of its 545 airplanes on over 300 are Dash 7s. And they're going to be materially delayed. They're out of the program for the coming year. That's going to be a big hit for them because they don't have any replacements for those. And that means they're going to have to keep older airplanes on, on lease, things like that. That's a, a bad one. But United Airlines, you know, they have about 700 max derivatives on order right now 700 and the dash 10 is the biggest one they've been banking on that and that's now out of the program so we're going to be looking at a very bumpy year because airlines these airlines a number of them aren't going to have the airplanes to put into the sky so Mike, what do you think the developments of today what does that tell us then about the ultimate impact that we could see from all of this oh it, it goes all through the entire economy I mean, you already had Alaska start to pull down some flying to small communities because they had to redistribute their fleet. Uh, they have airplanes on order that aren't going to come. They're going to have to do something about that. So all the way down, even to play, it, it, it goes not just Seattle and not just Chicago, but Kalispell is going to get hit with this. And then all the small suppliers, you've you got a big Boeing operation in Helena, Montana. That's going to be affected as well. So what Boeing has done, which is, I think, totally incompetent with this, uh, is going to hurt the entire economy. Totally incompetent. Those are those are extreme words there, Mike. I mean, we've heard from some of the CEOs. What are you seeing in terms of the, the shift, perhaps, in how CEOs are thinking about their future relationships with the company? Well, when you have United Airlines, the biggest customer now saying, we've got to find somebody else. And they might be able to do it. Boeing's dance car, or the South, or the dance card at Airbus is full until 2030 for narrow bodies. But they're going to be looking. So when you have these, this number of your customers tipped off, yeah, that's incompetent. You can't give it any other excuse, especially in light of the other things that have happened at Boeing. And uh, I'm just not I'm just not really confident with some of the responses that Calhoun has made, very honestly, do you, because he got him into this. Do you think that that leads to then, uh, because now that would potentially mean we see the second CEO change over in, what, six years for the company? Yeah, they may have to do it. I don't know where the board of directors is. I mean, you have their biggest customer, United, ticked off. 
you have Southwest, another big cu customer, kicked off and badly hurt financially as a result of this. Again, t taking all this together, I'm just wondering whether they really need to take a, a bulldozer to the front office and rethink things. How likely? Is that something that you think is even up for discussion right now? And, and walk us through, I guess, exactly how that could potentially here play out. Well, you'd have to have a, a quiet revolt or maybe even yeah. less of a quiet revolt at the board of directors level if the stock keeps dropping and if the future of the company looks dim. Right now, as I said, United have really ticked at them and United has the horsepower to maybe go to Airbus. You know, they only have about 200 Airbuses on order, but you know, when you have 700 Maxes on order of different types, uh, they got power and I think they may walk away. I don't know, to some degree they may walk. Mike, just lastly, while we have you, you mentioned those earnings that we saw come out from Southwest, and we've been monitoring the reaction in shares of LUV here this morning, at least as of right now, on the Yahoo Finance platform with about 10 minutes to go until the start of trade. Looks like they're holding on to some gains here. Anything that jumps out to you from that report about the consumer or some of the other labor kind of negotiations that they are moving through and towards as well in the flight attendance case? Hit on the head here. The, the new pilot contract at Swapa is going to be 50 percent by the by the end of the uh, by the time it becomes amendable again. Flight attendants could be looking for the same thing. So we haven't really worked that into that because that's going to change where Southwest can fly, how they can fly, what their economics are to places like Hawaii and things like that. So they're going to address that, and I don't think that's been looked at hard enough by the the folks on Wall Street yet. Are they able to still be a profitable, low cost carrier? with some of the new negotiations? Well, they can be profitable. They're not really a low cost carrier. They just do a very good job and people like me fly them because they do a damn good job. But overall, <laughs> very often the, their competition can even be lower. They're just a good airline and that's what keeps them alive. It isn't fares. Your precious cargo, Mike, precious cargo. <laughs> Thank you, <Jerry>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, always great to get your insight, especially on a day like today. Mike Boy, Boy Group International President. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's get to another big mover, and that is IBM. As shares on the rise after posting a 4% jump here in revenue on a year-over-year -year basis, also seeing the widest growth here in margins since 1999, putting it in perspective. All right, Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills joining us on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the latest on that. Madison. I hate to use this phrase, but IBM is so back this morning. I'm looking at the trade here up over 7%, and that is after beats on both the top line and bottom line of their earnings report. Why did we get this beat? Of course, it's due to AI, right? This company is investing in AI. This is no longer the hardware play that we've seen previously. This is an AI play. And the CEO talked about that on the earnings call, saying that they had invested $500 million in a fund that's going to be investing in AI startups. Think a little bit of competition there with Microsoft and OpenAI, perhaps. And their AI growth story, right? It has doubled in the past quarter. That's what led to what Amazon analysts saw as a little bit of a surprise from IBM with their free cash flow coming in above estimates at $11.2 billion. They're expecting free cash flow of $12 billion to come next year. That can be attributed to some upcoming layoffs, job cuts, and uh, some consolidation of con commercial real estate as well. The street rewarding this name today, guys. Street is rewarding this name. We're going to be talking about it a little bit more here later on in the program. We'll hear from Paul Meeks, the uh, veteran tech investor, talking about this turnaround story that maybe we are seeing play out there at IBM. All right, Madison, thank you. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief. Much more to dive into here. A number of trending tickers. Humana also under a tremendous amount of pressure here ahead of the open following its earnings release. More on that when we come back.
All right, you hear the music, you know what time it is. Time for some trending tickers. We're watching shares of Paramount after Skydance Media is reportedly in talks to take the media giant private, according to CNBC. The deal, however, would rely on merging Skydance with Paramount, according to the report. Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal has been all across this story. <laughs> Alexandra, what do we know? So it seems like every few weeks or so, there's another M&A report as it relates to Paramount. And we've heard Skydance Media be thrown around there, be in the mix. We got the report late last year that Skydance could possibly partner with private investment firm Redbird Capital to acquire National Amusements voting shares. Now, remember, National Amusements is the holding company for Paramount. It is led by Shari Redstone. It controls 77% of Paramount's voting shares. And this latest development really adds on to that report and what we've been hearing. Skydance is now reportedly actively working with Redbird Capital, along with another private investment firm, KKR, on a deal to buy national amusements. Now, there's also been preliminary talks with Paramount. I did reach out to all parties. I did not hear back at this point. But the kicker here is that the deal would require Skydance to merge with Paramount and take that company fully private. So it's very possible that this deal could fall through. Skydance would need to go and acquire capital in order to make this deal happen. Also, the fact that Paramount is a publicly traded company doesn't really solve all of their problems at this point. But I think moving forward, it's very clear that we're going to see a deal happen with Paramount. It's a question of when, who, and how. This company is just so small, about a $9 billion market cap. You compare that to a Disney or a Netflix. Disney has about $170 billion. Netflix, nearly $240 billion. So it's, it's one of those names that's been floated around. We've heard Warner Brothers Discovery maybe wants to merge with Paramount, too. So we'll see. 2024 could be the year. I was going to say, we've been talking so much about, and I remember going back to 2022, two years yes. ago, we were talking about forecasts here for 2023. There was this expectation of more consolidation within the sector. That was also one of the top predictions like you have covered mm -hmm. for 2024 and what we could see in the years to come. So maybe this year will be one of the one of the years that we get one of the big deals yep. for one of these uh, household names. All right, Allie, thank you. thank you. Let's take a look at shares of Humana here this morning, sinking after the company slashed its full year guidance. Humana also seeing a widening loss in its fourth quarter. A lot of this driven by the rise that we have seen in medical costs. We're also seeing the reaction in some of its competitors, other insurers that are out there, United Health, Cigna, CVS, even among the names under pressure here this morning. And to put in perspective, I guess, how short the earnings were, the results were in terms of what the street was anticipating. Mm. Their earnings for the most recent quarter, they saw they see adjusted earnings of approximately $16 a share, excuse me, for the guidance in 2024. That was just about half, just over half of what analysts had expected. So certainly their business really being pressured by the rise that we've seen in medical costs. Yeah, I mean, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, this most recent quarter, they said it reflects additional increases in Medicare Advantage medical costs, number one, and the trends there. Also, higher than anticipated inpatient utilization. So they weren't expecting this many people to say, you know what, let me take advantage of what I signed up for here. And that's just what they're seeing primarily for the months of November and December. So a further increase in non-inpatient trends uh, is also what they're tracking there, but all all of that playing directly into these results we saw. All that is in play, playing directly into these results. And remember, this is a sector that had been under pressure over the last week, ever since Humana did warn about the challenges that their business is facing, the fact that they did scale back some of those expectations. So now withdrawing 2025 earnings target, their 2024 profit forecast lower than what the street had been expecting. We certainly are seeing the ripple effects, not only in Humana stock, but also a number of the larger insurers as well. All right, well, let's get to the opening bell on Wall Street as we kick off another trading day here this week, the second to last trading day of the week. We want to talk about Friday Eve, but again, we are still looking at gains, I believe, here at the open, and we're seeing some excitement there for the opening bell. Lots of focus here on that GDP print that we got out this morning, also weighing that against a mixed bag when it comes to earnings so far. What's the rock for? coming back? Just bring the rock back for I the know, opening bell. I know. He the can't crowd, come back every day the crowd for that he pulled he was did. very impressive. Not surprising either. Cheers to right. Funfetti, though, here this morning. Latin finance, and then you've got, uh, of course, some Funfetti over at the New York Stock Exchange. We do. All right, well, let's get right to it. Madison Mills, she's part of the action down there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, breaking down the moves that we have seen. Also, what could be some of the catalysts here going forward? Maddie. 
Yeah, I'm just looking. We're seeing green across our screen here. It looks like the uh, Russell even is up 1.3% this morning. We've got the S&P up about three-tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ leading some of these gains around half a percent here. I'm also looking at the dollar gaining some strength. That could be an indication about potentially maybe we're seeing some question marks about what the Fed is going to do next. If they're going to keep rates higher for longer, that would be good for the dollar. Again, seeing that green across your screen. But the Russell, the biggest percentage gain here. We're going to break down those market moves. I'm very lucky to be joined by NICE's strategist on markets, Michael Ranke. Michael, thank you so much for making the time this morning. We talked about the economic data coming in strong. It's looking like immaculate disinflation, if I can say that. What do you think is going to be driving today's trade moving forward? Yeah, I mean, we did see futures overnight were kind of unchanged. And then once we got that GDP data, right, we did start to really move to the upside. Right, It's been really busy 24 hours between kind of earnings and ECB rate decision. You know, but that economic data does seem to be really driving the picture at this point. You know, that continues to kind of fall in that Goldilocks uh, you know, kind of you know, data in terms of you know, kind of uh, strong GDP, but the prices components within the GDP uh, were actually pretty tame, right? And we've seen kind of uh, you know the, the interest rate markets and yields moving a bit lower, right? And I think you know one of the real keys today is just whether we can kind of hold that strength. You know, yesterday in the last couple of days, we have seen the Russell gap higher over 1% for the last two days, but we failed right around that 2,000 level both of those days. So we'll have to see if we can kind of hold the gains you know, throughout today. And the Russell's been in a bear market, as you know. What do you think could be the single biggest catalyst to push it higher as it's higher right now, but keep it high through today's close? Right. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's 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 watching yields, right? So uh, one of the things that, that turned the market yesterday was a very weak five-year auction at one o'clock. Today, we have a $40 billion seven-year auction at one o'clock. So that's going to be a key. The 2000 level is very big from kind of a technical perspective, right? If you go back to kind of, uh, you know, March of 2022, too. That's where we broke down from that, you know, 2000 to 2050. We haven't been able to kind of break above that. If we can start to move above that today, you know, that's going to be a key. And what do you think is driving the trade more over the past couple of days and heading into uh, the end of the week tomorrow? Is it that macro picture that we're getting from the economic data or is it the earnings picture? Yeah, I mean, it's really been a mix, right? And we've had, you know, pretty solid uh, numbers, you know, especially within technology, right? Uh, if you look at kind of the cloud names, the semi names, uh, even the software names, as you mentioned, you know, kind of IBM last night. And I think, you know, what we've seen is we've really, you know, since last Thursday, the earnings has been driving the picture after we got that Taiwan semi update, and that's really kind of sent the you know that technology sector into a kind of a parabolic move to the upside. We did start to see some signs that you know were of exhaustion a little bit yesterday, and I think it's going to be key, just like the Russell, can you know those stocks which are moving higher again this morning, can they hold those gains as we move through the day? And what are you looking at more when you're sussing out that very question? Are you looking at the technicals or the fundamentals or a mix? Right. I mean, I think it's. I mean, every all the time, it, it is sort of a mix. I mean, I think you know the, the key, and there's also kind of the the investor sentiment perspective, right? Because we've seen the numbers, you know, from the tech companies, you know, come in strong, right? The question is, you know, have we raised the bar, and 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 can we hold those gains, right? Has the bar been raised a little bit too high from a price perspective? You know, when you start to see, you know, price action where you have strong earnings, but you know, stocks don't hold, you know can hold gains or move lower, right? That's something to take a note of, you know, when, when the price action is not fitting with the news. And lastly, I want to talk about the bad potential news here, some risks, a lot of geopolitical tensions right now. What are you looking at in terms of the market impact of those risks? Right. And so up until this point, uh, you know, I, I always sort of focus on oil, right? And, and with kind of what we've seen in the Middle East, right, we've seen kind of uh, oil prices remain pretty contained now. After we got the news out of China last night, right, we're starting to see uh, you know some opposing forces here, and and oil prices are starting to move higher. So ice Brent is just broke above its 200-day moving average, right? It's breaking this downtrend that we've been in since uh, September, and we're now testing the highs, you know, from mid-January and. and um, and uh, December, you know, right around 81, 81 and a half. So if we start to clear that, right, that's also something to you know, pay close attention to. Important levels there, Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. I read your midday uh, markets note every single day, so I really appreciate you. Guys, thanks so much for uh, having us this morning. Back to you. All right, Maddie, thank you so much for bringing uh, that to us. Of course, a lot of useful and helpful stats there from our guests. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. Like Maddie was just saying, we are still seeing gains across the board, continuing that upward momentum since the start of the week. More on that when we come back.
All right, a couple of minutes into the train day, you got stocks continuing to move higher. The Dow just about 100 points. Now, this comes after a record-breaking week, but might there be some bumps on the road ahead? Tell us more. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blicker standing by at the Interactive for us. Jared, should we be uh, putting on our seatbelts then? Oh, you should always wear your seatbelts. Uh, I'm not saying that I do point. that myself. And I'm a mom, but and I should know that. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I want to take a look at some markets. We were just talking about small caps with Michael Renking over at the over at ICE, and we can see small caps are leading the day. They're up 1.3 percent. Uh, Nasdaq is up half a percent, and the S&P and Dow are up a little bit less than that. Here's the S&P 600. This is the small caps, very similar to the Russell 2000. Over the last three days, it is now positive, but uh, small caps have really faltered this year. And something interesting is also happened. I want to point out the and, and chart here, the S&P 500 market cap weight. That's one we all know and love. And also the equal weight. And that's where each member gets, gets its own weighting. And you don't have those uh, cap weighted uh, mega caps that are really dominating the flows there. Uh, so S&P 500 uh, equal weight is actually underwater by 1.24%, while the S&P 500 market cap weight is up 2.5%. And this is nothing new. We saw this a year ago. We've been talking about the concentration for a long time. And here's with the weighting of all these big caps here, these mega caps, we can see that the performance is up 21% for the S&P 500 market cap weight over the last year versus 4% for equal weight. Now, what's really interesting is this. If you compare the S&P 500 equal weight to the Russell 2000, they look very similar. Now, the Russell 2000 has higher highs and higher and lower lows, uh, so a higher, more volatility, higher beta, but they've ended up at basically the same place, 4% versus just about 4% right there. But then when you can compare the NASDAQ 100 to the Russell 2000, and you might as well put the S&P 500 equal weight in there, that's when you see this knockout performance where the mega caps really shine up almost 50%. Want to show you guys what's going on in the sector action today. It's interesting because real estate and utilities have been lagging. They've been the two worst sectors this year, but not today. They are the two best. I think that's because we're getting a little bit of a reprieve in the bond market. The 10 years down 4%. What's not doing well today, consumer discretionary. Guess what the biggest weighting is at it, or the second biggest is Tesla. So Tesla down about 9%. Healthcare also in the red there. And let's just get a quick check on the NASDAQ 100. There's Tesla down 9%. NVIDIA. Part for the course, up another 1.77%, guys. Jared, thanks so much for breaking that all down, continuing to track some of the early market moves here. We're about 10 minutes into the session. we got to take another look at a trending ticker that's on our site, ServiceNow, ticker symbol N-O-W. Let's go there now. It is betting big on AI, raising its annual subscription revenue forecast, saying it plans to attract more clients to its new AI products. The company also seeing a 26% jump in fourth quarter revenue year over year. Shares are up just over for 1% this morning. The CEO of ServiceNow, Bill McDermott, actually had just spoken with our own Brian Sazi and Julie Hyman over at Davos with the World Economic Forum taking place there. What's particularly notable here is the lean into generative AI here, saying that it's injecting new fuel into their already high performing engine. I would also go one step further to add, they just netted a big partnership, I believe it was with EY as well, that was announced in tandem with or at least around the same time as these earnings results, which actually I think gives them even more of a reason to be one of the recommended platforms for a lot of those uh, consultants that are going to be going around talking with a lot of companies about their AI ambitions and then serving now perhaps has uh, that just additive of someone who is uh, in these sales meetings or at least in these strategy meetings for companies charting forth a roadmap for how companies can integrate generative AI even more. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of this is about generative AI, the leadership that JP Morgan noted it in the reaction here this morning to these results saying that this really solidifies the fact that ServiceNow does have a leadership with its gen AI portfolio. Remember though, this is a stock that has done very well over the last several months. Shares are up more than 40% off the low that we saw in October, closed yesterday at a record. So when we come into today's trading day, I think the question here for investors, whether or not this is a good buy at this point, is how much of this optimism that we are talking about right now when it comes to some of their leadership positions in generative AI, how much of that has at least been priced in 
for the short term. And you can see that run up there on your screen. But again, very, very strong results here from ServiceNow. When you take a look at some of these uh, data points here, an early sign, another sign, I should say, that we're seeing a bit of steadying with uh, IT spending from some of these uh, corporate companies. All right, well, let's keep it right here on Yahoo Finance's morning brief. We're going to dig into Big tech, IBM out with a very strong earnings report. Shares getting a big boost here in early trading. We've got more on that when we come back. IBM shares are getting a big boost here this morning thanks to strong demand for AI. The legacy tech giant beating on earnings, issuing an upbeat outlook here for 2024. Now, when we talk about that demand for AI business for Watson X, that's his Gen AI platform, that about doubled from the previous quarter. And you're looking at gains of just nearly 11%. So is it fair to say the big blue is back? We want to get right to it to, with Paul Meeks. He's the veteran tech investor, also an accounting and finance professor at Citadel. Paul, it's great to have you. I was going through uh, the early reaction here from analysts this morning. Jeffrey's calling it a turnaround story here for IBM. What do you think? Well, I think the company is definitely back. I think that uh, that's not necessarily a big secret. Uh, the only question we have, and you raised the same issue with ServiceNow before the break, is all the goodies already baked into that stock price. I think IBM is slightly expensive to modestly expensive. And even though they had a pretty nice quarter, and of course, focused on selling AI-centric servers, you know, the stock has eclipsed my price target. Uh, maybe I take it up a bit. You know, what I would recommend investors do on the heels of this report is to probably just hold the stock if you have it. Uh, I'm intrigued about buying it in the future, but would have to dip first. I'm not a big fan of you know buying stocks up six, seven percent in a single session. You know, we were speaking earlier with uh, Mike Boyd uh, of Boyd Group, and we were discussing the incompetence, his words, of this management team at, at Boeing right now. Would wonder what your view is, and do you believe that there's a management change that needs to be made? You know, it's really sad because, you know, this is the uh, gang that can't shoot straight. And so I think a management change, probably necessary, because it looks like you know, one-off manufacturing issues have become more and more pervasive. Now, the nice thing about 
uh, this company, which makes you probably want to buy it on a significant fall in the stock price, is they're essentially an oligopolist. Even with their troubles, there's two players on the global stage that, uh, at least in production volumes, uh, churn out these commercial aircraft. And so, yeah, with uh, Boeing, I think a uh, management change must be in order. Remember, the current CEO came up through uh, the board of directors. So I would say it's a semi-internal hire. Last time they had some issues, but you need to bring on someone who is an absolute manufacturing genius to run that company. Is it, is it clear at this point if there is a suitor for that role? And, and ultimately, for the, even the response that they've had internally at this point, where, where the board of directors is at, that was, that was brought up in one of our conversations earlier. Yeah, it remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I was really uh, despondent when I saw, you know, one problem, okay, that's a one-off, lead to more, to more, to more. And of course, you see that their major customers, these commercial airlines, are now getting hit on their very own financial results. Alaska, the uh, next to pre-announce, you know, the impact. So this will be interesting. And of course, they probably shouldn't rush it. They should probably take their time and be very deliberate. And uh, again, a manufacturing guru, probably from the outside or someone in the organization on the management team that has been more adamant about quality and safety all along. Maybe that person has been identified internally. Paul, let's talk about some of the movements here that we see more broadly speaking in the market. Yes, we could talk a lot about some of the weakness and some of the concerns, obviously, surrounding Boeing stock right now. Comparing that to some of the tech giants that continue to outperform within this environment, as you are evaluating attractive buys right now, given the valuation concerns, that are out there. Walk us through how you're identifying those that you think are still well positioned in this current environment. Yeah, so I'm a, a tech focused investor, always have been. Uh, the way I look at the sector, now, the overall comment I'll make is I think the S&P 500 this year will be up again more than its 10% per year long term average. And I think of the 11 sectors that comprise the economy, Technology, again, will be one of the top performers. I didn't think we were going to have such great outperformance as we started the month of January. But I look at the tech stocks like this. I try to embrace some big, durable themes. And I don't want to say I ignore valuation for those winners, but I take less of a look at valuation. And then I try to add in some down and out technology stocks that are clearly cheap, but they still have a catalyst. So if you have that uh, barbell, uh, maybe uh, less price sensitive leaders and big themes, and then occasionally when a company that's still a good company misses its quarterly earnings, all companies do from time to time, the stock has a uh, big dip, as long as the reason that it missed its quarterly earnings is transitory and not secular, I buy those stocks. So if you play that barbell of tech cheap and tech expensive, but playing all of the uh, current themes, I like my odds. Paul, always a pleasure to get some of your insights. Thanks so much for taking some of the time here this morning. Yes. Be well, guys. All right. You too. Thanks, Paul. Paul Meeks there. We've got more market coverage ahead, and we'll also be jumping over to look at how investors are keeping an eye on Chinese stocks amid the rising concerns of economic downturn in the country. We've got much more on that.
It appears that investors are turning to shrinking short positions, fund flows, and options in Chinese stocks. This comes just after Beijing made some bold moves to inject more financial stimulus into a weakening economy. You're taking a look at the Hong Seng. It's actually up nearly 2 percent. Of course, trading has uh, ended in the Asia-Pacific region for today. However, one of the huge things to track is the stimulus that's been put into the economy and where specifically, whether that be in the property or whether that starts to show up circulating more so in the stock market as well here. And some of these moves suggest that that's exactly what's expected and you have a lot of short covering in the near term. You do. It's a bit of a contrarian bet, especially when you take into account some of the uh, data that we have gotten out, especially the GDP numbers that were released last week. Are clearly a bit worrisome here for China's recovery story here going forward, the fact that this recovery may be delayed, uh, an issue here for these names. But then you got to ask, and it looks like at least this is some of the uh, patterns or the thought process that we're seeing there on this on the street, just how much of this has already been priced into these stocks, the fact that some of these names have been under such a tremendous amount of pressure, whether or not there's been a bit of a shift here in thinking in terms of some of those investment opportunities within the market. But again, some of the stats that S3 Partners did pull together here in terms of that shift that we are seeing, they're talking about the fact that short interest on U.S. listed Chinese and Hong Kong stocks had had dropped about 15 percent over the 30 days through January 22nd. That's according to the latest data there from S3 Partners. All right, we got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live this morning, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading session today. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks are higher as fourth quarter U.S. GDP comes in hotter than expected. The U.S. economy growing by 3.3%. All right, let's take a look at some of those individual movers here. Microsoft cutting 1,900 workers in its video gaming divisions. That includes Activision Blizzard, according to a report by The Verge. Now, the cuts represent about 8% of Microsoft's 22,000 gaming workers. And this comes just three months after the tech giant finalized its buyout of Activision. And another big tech company in the news. Apple, IDC, reporting iPhone shipments fell 2.1% in China last quarter, adding to demand concerns right now. The shares flat, just barely to the upside right now. All right, and Nokia shares jumping this morning despite reporting a double-digit decline in sales, also a drop in profit in the fourth quarter. Investors, though, they seem optimistic about their planned turnaround, uh, their expected recovery, I should say, and also future cost controls. JP Morgan writing in a note that, quote, overall, we see results as strong in a difficult environment. All right, well, Boeing setbacks continue with the FAA halting production of its 737 MAX aircraft. I should say halting increases in production. Now, despite the agency approving an inspection process for ground 737 MAX 9 planes, our next guest downgrading Boeing to neutral from buy, also lowering its price target to 225 from 255, calling the pause to production of all 737 MAX planes a nearly worst case scenario. Ron Epstein, he's Bank of America's managing director, joins us now. So, Ron, we first talked to you a couple of weeks ago when we first got the news of the door blowing off of uh, one of Boeing's planes. Now you're a bit more skeptical, I would say, about Boeing. So why now downgrade? Yeah, we weren't expecting this last move from the FAA. Uh, kind of the, one of the big takeaways from this, this wasn't just focused on the, the, the MAX 9. This impacts all MAX production, so the MAX 8 and MAX 9. Um, it's, as you noted, it's important that it's it's holding production steady, but part of the Boeing thesis for this year was increasing in production, and this just makes that that less clear. Um, so, you know, we took a step to the sidelines, we downgraded to neutral. Um, hopefully there's a silver lining in all this. Once everything gets sorted out, they get the quality system back to where it should be, that, you know, maybe in the second half of the year, we can get back on a, on a ramp up trajectory that's more supportive of uh, the shares, cash flow generation, so on and, and, and so forth. Do but they, to, to be to be blunt, we weren't expecting this this to happen, and so yeah. Do they achieve all of that with the same management team, Ron? Yeah, and that's a, a question that many many folks have asked. Um, you, you, you know, as you can imagine, in, in all kinds of circles. Um, I, I think it really depends on where the strategy goes from here. Um, you know, for, for if you know if the current management team can can, can do it or not. Um, just to be clear, you know, what's going on at Boeing is uh, the result of you know probably you know, almost 15, 20 years of a cultural shift in the, in the company. And that just won't change overnight, you know, regardless of who you put in one role. And, and just one person can't do that. It has to be, be the whole company. Now, investors and other stakeholders, you think about it, there's investors, there's suppliers, uh, there's employees. Uh, a lot of them have been you know, out looking for management change, but, but we'll see how it all goes. What do you think this is going to do for future orders? Obviously, we heard some updates here from Southwest this morning. We heard some uh, choice words that, uh, from United CEO Scott Kirby during their earnings release. In terms of winning back trust, not only with the customer or the traveler, I should say, but also with their clients, what should or what needs to happen in order for that to, or in order for Calhoun or whoever it may be the CEO, be successful at that? Yeah, I mean, it's just very frustrating for their for their yeah. customers. Clearly, right? I mean, a, a key point of airlines is growth, and they need they need the the lift to to grow. Um, as you mentioned, several customers have come out with you know very very frustrated. Uh, Ryanair is even you know sending engineers to the factory, so on and so forth. You know, so what are you going to do? You know, airlines are going to try to look for some alternative lift. I mean, you know, ultimately this can't be good for market share for Boeing. But but that being said, there are only two players who make large commercial jets today. That's the Boeing company, and that's Airbus, uh, and and the industry isn't capitalized for either one of them to do it all, right? So it's it's important for the industry, uh, it's important for the nation for Boeing to get back on track, and you know our hope is that you know after these reviews and they update the quality system, that that indeed can happen. Ron, is it is it worse for Boeing? Is that still not yet behind them? We'll see, right? I mean, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 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 to be blunt, you know, here we are, almost four years after the 
uh, initial you know max tragedy. And I don't think anybody expected to be be where we are today. Uh, but that just kind of reiterates the point that these kind of things just don't change overnight. It, it takes a long time. Uh, and 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 hopefully the worst is behind us. But I but I don't I don't know that. I wish I could say that. Um, but 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 we'll see. Uh, uh, hopefully this is a step in the right direction, uh, given the, the review of, of the quality system. You know, the, the good news here, this isn't a, a design problem, it's a fabrication problem. So ultimately it should be addressable. Do you believe that this leads towards a long-term shift from some of the largest customers that Boeing has, especially for that max line? Yeah, I mean, you've already seen it. So just to give you some rough numbers, uh, you know, Airbus has about about 11,000 narrow bodies in their backlog. Boeing has about four and a half thousand. Of that 11,000 narrow bodies, so that's A320 family versus 737 family. So they have over twice as many in backlog. And then of that 11,000 uh, A320s, uh, 70, about 70% 70 of those are A321s. Um, that's the biggest variant uh, in the family. So Airbus has more A321s in its backlog than Boeing has 737s in the backlog. And, you know, and one of the fears of this is that you'll see continue to see eroding market share. So after this is behind us, Boeing has to do a lot of work to get back customer confidence. And one of the things that we've written a lot about is we do think Boeing needs to do, do a new airplane. Um, they could do a new narrow body, they could do a new middle market of the airplane, new middle market airplane that's a larger airplane, a little more range. Uh, but we think that's important for the culture of the company to attract engineering talent and, and ultimately to, uh, to, to have presence in the market. Historically, Ron, how often do issues like what Boeing has faced now time and, and time again with the MAX line cascade through to consumer, the, the passenger perception of a company and the airline that might even fly a majority of those aircraft as well? And, you know, how are airlines themselves trying to do some damage control there? Yeah, I think, I think well, interestingly enough, I don't think consumers are always all that aware of what they're flying on, right? I mean, I am. Will they be uh, more you after are, but, this? But, you know, but, you know and, I, and I, I tend to be, be focused on that sort of thing. I think for a while there is some customer recognition of it, but that ultimately tends to fade. But the bigger question and the more important question, if you're running an airline, just as an example, you're Scott Kirby at United, and you're running an airline and you have future fleet plans and you have crews and all kinds of things set up behind it. You know, bringing an airplane into an airline is a really complicated thing. Mm -hmm. You've got you, you've got like probably ten sets of crews. There's a lot of people, all kinds. Of, so this is super disruptive. So from an airline perspective, getting some clarity and consistency for their planning is, is super important. Uh, on the consumer side, clearly it's not good, but these things tend to fade ultimately. Um, but but we'll see. Um, and then, and then I think the point you're trying to raise is where is the tipping point with consumers? And I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, kind of what's gone on with the Max and this recurring theme of, you know, these bolts were loose, that door blew out, this was a problem, is unprecedented. All right, Ron Epstein, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on after you did downgrade Boeing stock. We appreciate you taking the time. Bank of America's managing director covering aerospace, defense, and multi-industrials. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. All right, well, Comcast, the latest media giant to report earnings, seeing net income rise just under 8% on a year-over-year -year basis. The company also adding 3 million subscribers to its streaming platform, Peacock, in the fourth quarter, bringing its total to 31 million. We want to bring in Jonathan Chaplin. He's New Street Research Managing Partner joining us now. Jonathan, it's great to see you here. Take a look at Comcast stock up just about 5%. It seems like, at least at the surface here, taking a look at the, the initial take on this earnings report, a strong quarter here for the company. What's your reaction? Yeah, so I think financial results were great. Their revenue was better in pretty much every segment than people expected. Profitability was better across the board as well. If you adjust out the impact of uh, severance charges, which are sort of one-time impacts that nobody anticipated. So overall, looking at the financials, this was a, a better, just clearly a better than expected quarter, which is what's driving the stock up today. With Peacock and the subscriber numbers that we've seen and all of the kind of streaming news that we've seen come forward this week, of course, comparing Comcast's service with Netflix and what we've seen come through in their subscriber figures, where ultimately does this tell you about the consumer who is looking at the entertainment landscape right now and deciding where they're getting the, mes the most value? 
So, you know, our, our thoughts on the streaming landscape in general or the content landscape in general is that it's it's oversupplied and ultimately there won't be enough dollars going around to support all of the all of the different platforms out there. I think the way that Comcast is approaching it, though, is a little bit different from everybody else in a couple of respects. First of all, they're really looking at Peacock as an extension of or sort of part of an integrated media business where they've got linear uh, linear li linear channels um, and Peacock and they're 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 running the businesses um, uh, in terms of sort of content uh, production as well as their their relationships with advertisers in an integrated fashion and they're really focused at this stage on um, uh, on sort of scaling in the US market as opposed to trying to build out a global platform. And so as we look at Peacock, what I think we've passed the peak of losses for Peacock, um, they're probably going to stabilize in terms of programming costs here. They're growing subscribers at a pr pretty phenomenal rate. And if they can continue to do that, this is going to be the second streaming platform that crosses the line into profitability over the course of uh, probably the next sort of four to six quarters in in our view. John, I'm curious just to get your take more broadly speaking when you're trying to evaluate a streamer uh, specifically focusing on their Peacock business, the value add that that is to a company the size of Comcast and comparing that and I guess trying to really strategize that in with some of the challenges and headwinds that are going on with the remainder of the streaming sector reports out today that maybe there could be an interested uh, buyout here for Paramount. It, how big of a value add do you see the streaming service Peacock being here for Comcast business? So um, I, I think if you were to look at, at, at Peacock as a standalone business, this will ultimately be a very valuable, um, a, a very valuable business for, for, for Comcast, but it's not really a standalone business. You have to look at it in the context of NBCU overall. So what's happening is the way content is being consumed uh, is shifting. They've got these legacy media properties over at NBCU, um, which are under pressure, and they're building Peacock alongside those leg legacy properties to ensure that they're positioned to capture um, the sort of the 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 the, the content market uh, uh, as it as it shifts from linear to to streaming, and so it's, it's you know when, when you look at NBCU as a totality, um, the objective really is to kind of preserve the value that they have in that overall franchise using Peacock as opposed to sort of Peacock being an entity of standalone value. Um, that adds to the value of NBCU. That you know what they're creating in value at Peacock, they're losing to some extent on the on the other side of the house. Jonathan Chaplin, New Street Research Managing Partner. Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time here to break down earnings results from Comcast. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. From iPhones and iPads to Macs, Apple Watches, and AirPods, Apple's products are a daily necessity for millions, and the numbers prove it. The company generated more than $394 billion in revenue in 2022 alone. But how were they able to achieve such staggering success? Beyond the ticker charts its path to becoming a tech giant. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple in Los Altos, California in 1976. That same year, Wozniak built the company's first product, the Apple One. Apple debuted the Macintosh with its now iconic 1984 commercial during Super Bowl 18. The Macintosh stood out because it was the first mass market personal computer to feature a graphical user interface and mouse. Jobs left Apple after his famous falling out with CEO John Scully in 1985 and subsequently founded the next computer company. In 1991, Apple introduced the PowerBook line, which set the standard for most modern laptops. In 1996, after a run of CEOs, Jobs returned to Apple. The company purchased Next to use its operating system and named Jobs interim CEO in 1997. Apple introduced the iMac in 98, and the line would go on to sell millions of units. 
Three years later, Apple debuted its first iPod, which could store roughly a thousand songs. In that same year, the company opened its first Apple stores. But it was in 2007 that Apple unveiled its most important product of all, the iPhone. A revolutionary device, the iPhone helped create an entire business model around apps and the App Store. Jobs suffered from pancreatic cancer towards the end of his second term as CEO. He resigned from the company just before his death, and Tim Cook took over as CEO in 2011. In 2015, Apple took the wraps off of its first new device since Cook took over as head of Apple, the Apple Watch. Just seven years later, Apple became the world's first publicly traded company to reach a market cap of $3 trillion. And in June 2023, the company unveiled its most ambitious product yet, the Vision Pro. A mixed reality headset, the Vision Pro is scheduled to launch in early 2024. U.S. economy growing faster than expected in the final quarter of 2023. GDP coming in at an annualized rate of 3.3% in Q4. That is faster than consensus forecast for the year. The economy grew at a rate of 2.5%. That was up from 1.9% in 2022. So what do all these numbers mean for the Fed and the timing of rate cuts? The big question, the billion, trillion dollar question everyone's asking right now. We want to bring in David Doyle. He is at Macquarie's head of economics. David, it's good to have you here. So I'm curious how you're thinking about the timing of that first rate cut, but then looking beyond that, the rate, uh, how how frequent of the of rate cuts we are going to get here, the pace of the cuts, I should say, there we go, from the Fed. What do you think that's going to look like? 
Yeah, so I, I think a lot of it will come down to the labor market and, and some of the reports that we have upcoming. In particular, the employment report uh, for January will include significant provisions uh, going back. Uh, so we'll get more of, I think, more of a sense or a better sense of what the underlying pace of jobs growth is there. There's also the potential for new population adjustments to impact uh, the unemployment rate. So I think those will go a long ways uh, towards shaping the, the Federal Reserve's thinking. Uh, I have a hard time uh, seeing them going in, in March, which I know, uh, you know some other folks are out there suggesting will be the case. Um, I suspect it'll, it could be one or two meetings following that that you would start to see them uh, lowering the policy rate. And, and I suspect you know if, if the growth holds up, like today's uh, GDP report suggests, that that pace of easing um, would be gradual. Now, if the unemployment rate is rising more significantly, then, then you could see something more aggressive. And so, David, when we think about what the Fed would have to see in terms of the data that continues to pour through in advance of their next meeting, what most notably is actually going to move the dial towards that first cut? Yeah, so, you know, I think first and foremost, they are focused on inflation um, and, and core inflation, core PCE inflation. So that data out in today's report suggested a 2 percent quarter on quarter annualized pace. Um, but but I, I, I don't know if that will be enough. I don't, I don't think that'll be enough to, to, to move the needle for them towards a, a March cut. I think they need to see more evidence uh, that inflation or core inflation is heading back towards the, the, the 2 percent target on a year over year basis. I think also they'd have to be confident that there is um, you know, some, some slack building up in, in the labor market. We have seen some softening in the labor data. Uh, but but you know if, if that proves temporary and the labor market reaccelerates, that would give them pause and, and lead them to hold off on on any potential rate cuts. Do you expect that to happen, David, in terms of the labor market? Yeah, I I don't believe that the labor market will reaccelerate. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that we will see a, a further weakening ahead, um, and that the Fed will eventually move to cut rates. Um, the timing of though, of course, is is tricky. Um, and I but I do think that. Given where inflation is and where inflation is trending, the Fed will be there if we do start to see that that labor market weakness uh, coming about, and you'll see them respond uh, with with rate cuts to try and stabilize growth, stabilize the labor market, um, as long as inflation looks like it's it's stabilizing at around the two percent level. What what is the tone that the Fed must strike in order for? the markets to actually believe that there is kind of this pathway of rate cuts that can be expected? I, I, I honestly, I think it's, you know, folks will be uh, familiar with the message, but I, I honestly think they, they just have to reinforce the fact that they're data dependent and they'll respond to the data and that they have a dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment, and they'll do what they can to ensure the fulfillment of that dual mandate. It looks like, you know, we're making progress on that or they've made significant progress on the price stability component. And that is fantastic news, because what it means is that if you start to see any softening on the employment side, that they will now have the flexibility to, to cut rates as needed. And that removes significant downside risks from from the economic backdrop. David, there's not much uh, expected really to come out of the next Fed meeting. I'm curious, though, just about a week out, what are you going to be listening for? What will you be looking for in terms of updating any of your forecasts or really the timing component of this, going back to where we started the combo? Yeah, I, I don't, I think you're right. I, I don't know if there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of news coming out of uh, next week's meeting. Um, what will I be looking for? I think in Chair Powell's press conference, he'll likely be asked several questions, I would anticipate, surrounding the timing of potential rate cuts or what the economic conditions are that would result in them starting to cut rates. So I think anything in and around that will, you know, drive market reaction and, and cause, potentially cause folks such as myself to, to revisit their baseline forecast for potential Fed policy over the next year. David, appreciate the time here this morning. We're all going to be sitting on the end of our seats listening to Fed Chair Jay Powell very eminently, well, shortly next week, at least as we get into some of these meetings over the course of 2024 here. Thanks so much, David Doyle. Thanks for having me. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The price of Bitcoin has no shortage of catalysts from the debate around regulation to whether it's a security or a commodity and whether or not it really is digital gold. But one event is undeniable in its impact on the world's most premier digital asset, the halving. Every four years, the reward for mining the biggest cryptocurrency is cut in half. This happens in order to reduce the amount of coins in circulation. How is it calculated? Well, it happens specifically every time 210,000 blocks are mined. We can calculate the date fairly precisely with the knowledge that the average block time for Bitcoin mining is around 10 minutes. That calculation gets us very close to four years. Why is it needed? Because there's only so much Bitcoin available, 21 million to be exact. And like any other cryptocurrency, it needs to remain scarce to hold its value. So how often does this happen? Well, the halving takes place every four years. The first in 2012 decreased the award for creating a new block from 50 to 25 Bitcoin. The second halving in 2016, that lowered the reward further from 25 Bitcoin to 12 and a half Bitcoin. Last time out, 2020. And you guessed it, we halved again. The block award dropping to 6.25 Bitcoin. So, there's nothing wrong with your math here. This time around, the block reward miners will receive half, 3.125 Bitcoin. The big question, of course, what happens to the price? Now, the moves could be significant. In the past, we've seen Bitcoin rise after a halving event, though there's no certainty that this will always be the outcome. The other key focus is the outcome for the miners. The rewards that they're generating will, of course, diminish, and that's not great for an industry with a very high cost burden. Keep an eye on how the big publicly listed miners, the likes of Marathon and Riot, manage this event. As ever, talks of consolidation will no doubt do the rounds. No matter how you look at it, the event will have serious consequences for all crypto stakeholders and will be across all of the developments here at Yahoo Finance.
Oil prices moving to session highs on demand expectations following that stronger than expected GDP print that we got out before the bell this morning. You're looking at crude just above 76 bucks a barrel. Ness Frey joins us now with a closer look at this move higher, Ness, that we've seen over the last couple of sessions. Yeah, that's right. Today's gains adding to yesterday's session, and we saw these uh, session highs earlier this morning after that GDP, uh, GDP print, uh, preliminary print in the U.S. That's forecasting basically also for the oil market, at least, that there will be ro robust demand going forward. You also have some stimulus coming out of China, so that has been also very bullish for oil prices. And as you mentioned today, we're seeing WTI up more than 1.5%. Brent crude up more than 1%. And this adds to yesterday's gains where the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, said that the U.S. production declined by a million barrels per day last week. That's uh, because of mainly some freezing temperatures across oil producing states. We know that North Dakota had to curb some of its oil production, and that's the third largest oil producer in the U.S. Uh, meanwhile, also, we saw stockpiles of crude going down significantly. Economists had been expecting 1.4 million barrels, and uh, there was a drop instead of 9.23 million barrels last week. So a big draw when it comes to crude stockpiles. And then we did see gasoline stockpiles go higher, so that would sort of counter that other trend. But nevertheless, bottom line is that the freezing temperatures in the U.S. have definitely impacted production, and it's also impacted refinery with refinery capacity at 85.5 percent last week because refineries had to shut down either for maintenance or because of the cold temperatures. All right. And that's excellent breakdown there as always. And as for a we appreciate it. Thank you. Well, China ramping up stimulus this week. The People's Bank of China cutting the reserve requirement ratio, reducing the amount of cash that banks are required to hold in reserve, sending shares of U.S. listed Chinese stocks higher this week. But is this enough to help China's struggling economy? We turn to Jeffrey Kleintop, Charles Schwab, chief global investment strategist, to tell us more. Jeffrey, is it is it that alone? I mean, there's also been some short covering as well. What do you believe is perhaps most pronounced within the tape within some of the Asia Pacific but greater China specific stocks? I guess the size of the reserve rate cut, the reserve ratio cuts for banks have typically been 25 basis points over the last couple of years. So this is a 50 basis point cut to 10% for the largest banks. That's pretty big. I, I think the last time we saw that was in 2021 in response to uh, the pandemic and, and the global slowdown we saw then. But when it comes to spurring demand in the economy, I think the cut is going to have limited effectiveness on its own. The, the PBOC's move does release significant liquidity to banks, which should help the banks support infrastructure spending and maybe affordable housing this year. But lower rates or more credit availability isn't China's problem. In fact, it may only worsen its ongoing battle with deflation, which is weighing on demand and profit growth. Yeah, and Jeffrey, taking that into account, it sounds like then, to say the least, this rally that maybe we're seeing you expect to be a bit temporary. I think the question, though, for investors is, what that bottom looks like for the Chinese market. Have we seen that yet? Have we, or, or I guess, what more specifically do you think that downside risk could look like? Well, the, the 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 real turnaround, the real issue is turning around consumer sentiment, and not even stock market sentiment within China. It's this weak private sector demand, while home buyer deposits remain at risk in the form of the liabilities of failing developers. Remember, you put down 30 to 50 percent in cash when you want a developer to start building your house in China. And now the troubles with those developers mean some of those deposits could disappear. And that's what consumers are worried about, a big loss of their, their lifetime savings. So reviving growth and confidence will require some type of explicit government guarantee of those home buyer deposits at those uh, developers. Now, there may be more efforts by policymakers in the weeks ahead, leading up to the start of the National People's Congress on March 5th. In the meantime, China's efforts to prop up its stock market with some buying, uh, and investors were calling the 60% jump, that's six zero jump in Chinese stocks during the three months that followed the end of lockdowns in late 2022. Need to remember that all the efforts that China's put in place over the last year or so have been short-lived and quickly reversed in the stock market with further declines. Yeah, the Chinese economy, 
2023, the projection was for it to grow at about 5.4%. It's expected to slow, according to the IMF, to 4.6% in 2024. With the stimulus that they're putting into the system there, how and what is the probability that we will actually reach that figure for this year, considering we were kind of off of the grand expectations that we had had at the start of 2023 last year? Possible, but it's not good quality growth. What I mean by that is it's simply infrastructure. Uh, China's frequently had problems of, you know, building uh, ghost cities and, and bridges to nowhere. And, and that's one of the challenges is when China faces these slowdowns, they have a difficult time addressing consumer demand. And so you get government sponsored spending. Uh, now that does generate growth and, and does have some spill over to the private sector, but it's not as good. It's not as healthy as actual consumer driven demand. The consumer drives much of China's economy as it does in the US and elsewhere. So getting consumer sentiment turned around is the key here. So they can hit that target, but not in a way that's really generating uh, a lot in terms of profit growth or, or consumer incomes. So, Jeffrey, what's the advice there? What are you telling your clients in terms of the approach to this region? And if China doesn't look attractive at this point, how are you positioned then for 2024? When I look to Asia, I'm much more excited about Japan than what I'm seeing in China. So uh, Japan stock market, the best performing one in the world so far this year, on the back of a 29% gain last year. Japan's got a number of things going for it, in addition to picking up manufacturing share, share from China as investors move or businesses move to invest in a more uh, friendly location, I guess, as you think about supply chains. I'd also add that uh, Japan's putting in place some changes at the Tokyo Stock Exchange uh, that are making uh, shareholders uh, enhancing shareholder returns in terms of more dividends and share buybacks. And of course, uh, Japan itself is uh, likely to raise rates this year, the Bank of Japan, uh, and that may lift the currency. So also getting that win to the back of investors. So much more excited by what I'm seeing in the developed market of Japan than the emerging market of China. All right, Jeffrey Kleintop, always great to, to speak with you here. Charles Schwab, a Chief Global Investment Strategist. Thanks for having Thanks. me. All right, much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Alphabet could be making its big artificial intelligence play as it announces a strategic partnership between its cloud business and open source AI platform Hugging Face. The partnership gives the developers on Hugging Face's platform access to Google's AI infrastructure and cloud resources, while Google becomes a preferred destination for thousands of developers. Joining us now with more on the deal is Jeff Boudier, who is the Hugging Face head of product. Jeff, great to finally speak with you. We've heard so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. We've heard so much about your tenure, your time at Hugging Face. And ultimately, I think a lot of viewers are wondering right now, is this analogous to what we had seen Microsoft and OpenAI do now between Google and Hugging Face? No, I would say it's quite uh, different. And it's really an opportunity uh, to make it really easy for Google Cloud customers to build their own AI with open models. Today, we host over a million models, data sets, applications for text, audio, video, time series, biology, you name it. And all of these models will be very easy to access from Google Cloud will be very easy to use with the latest hardware available on Google Cloud. And Jeff, putting that in perspective for our viewers who maybe aren't exactly familiar with your platform and the relationship that you have with some of these other large companies, obviously backed by household names when it comes to NVIDIA, when it comes to Google, so furthering uh, that partnership there, where are we when we talk about this AI race? And in terms of the value of hugging face, is this? do you view this as kind of the real focus here for companies in the second year of adoption? Yes, uh, our mission is to democratize good machine learning. And we do this through open science, open source, and by making it easy for companies to build their own AI. And I think through this last uh, fundraise and all of our great investors, uh, the ecosystem around AI validated our vision that companies need to be able to build their own AI in-house, that they can host, they can control themselves. And so I think it's the first time that we had you know, Google along with Amazon, and we had NVIDIA along with AMD and Intel, and we had Salesforce along with IBM all coming together around this, va this vision and embracing open source AI. Jeff, when you think about the end user of some of the products that are and the applications that are going to come out uh, as uh, a part of this partnership that's moved forward and, and as the kind of delta from, you know, this announcement between Google and, and Hugging Face, how is this going to become tangible to somebody at the end of the day where they can feel the difference of generative AI? Oh, it's been super fun to work uh, with all the different teams uh, within Google, uh, from Vertex AI to their Kubernetes uh, team. Uh, you can expect a lot of experiences coming from this partnership. Um, you can expect hugging face models, again, to process text, to generate images, to uh, transcribe audio, to be all easily available uh, within Google Cloud through Vertex AI and then their model garden through their compute and infrastructure products. You can also expect uh, that it's going to be very easy on Hugging Face, where we have millions of data scientists and developers coming every month to build their own AI to apply those models uh, within Google Cloud directly from Hugging Face. You know, one of the interesting comments that we heard from the CEO of um, Salesforce, Mark Benioff, during our conversation with him at Davos at, at the World Economic Forum was talking about how AI should be a human right. He also did address some of the concerns. What concerns still linger from your perspective around generative AI that the industry still needs to solve for? Yes, the open source community uh, uh, has been tackling all of the main issues uh, that have been identified uh, by the uh, AI research uh, community and working through those issues uh, openly, transparently through open source. And I think that's a huge part uh, of the solution. And what we want at Hugging Face is also to make those open models and open source AI easily accessible to companies so that they can control their own AI destiny, so that they can host themselves uh, the models uh, and they can uh, protect uh, their data as well. 
And just lastly, Jeff, we got to ask you, I mean, in our conversations with Clem in the past, we've asked what a pipeline or, or, or a pathway rather to an IPO looks like. We know that the latest funding round was at about $235 million, $4.5 billion valuation. You know, when you think of Hugging Face and, and the growth from this point forward, are we still talking a, a $4.5 billion valuation even after this partnership? And, and what's kind of the next inflection point for growing out that valuation? Well, I think uh, what's important for us is really to uh, double down on our vision and uh, make open models and open source AI as accessible uh, as possible. Uh, this Google uh, partnership is going to be uh, a great uh, step towards that. We still have a lot to do. We did a lot of progress last year. But I think this year is going to be very interesting because so many companies have experimented with generative AI uh, over the last year. And I think today is the year when they're going to want to really build things seriously, uh, as they do with other kind of technology, meaning in-house. And that means for a large part with open models and open source AI. Jeff Boudier, who is the Hugging Face head of product. Jeff, you guys have one of the best logos in the business, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Can you see it? See. Yeah, I can, see, I can see it right over your shoulder. I mean, who doesn't okay, want to hug at the end of the day? All right, Jeff, <laughs> appreciate the time. Thank you, Brad. Thanks. Well, some investors in Shein might be losing some of their faith in the company's future. Backers of the fast fashion retailer, they're looking to sell shares in private market deals that put the company's value as low as $45 billion. That's according to a Bloomberg report. That's down roughly a third from the $66 billion valuation that the fashion giant reached in a fundraising round back in May of 2023. And this comes after mounting pressure from competitors like Timu, which filed a lawsuit against Shein last month for a, quote, Mafia-style intimidation of suppliers. Okay, so we'll see how that lawsuit plays out. But ultimately here, this is an IPO market story at the end of the day, a company that was widely expected and is widely expected to make its debut this year. Yeah, exactly. And we also want to point out, not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison when we're talking about private transactions versus what exactly demand is going to potentially look like in the public markets. But it does put things in perspective, right? And it is a good gauge of investor appetite and exactly how this public debut, if in fact we do see uh, she enlist here in the U.S., it gives us a good sense, a better gauge on interest. So that's why we're talking about it today. But I also want to point out that we got we got an interesting report from CNBC yesterday saying in the midst of all this, the Cyberspace Administration of China is also reviewing Xi'an's supply chain presence in the country. And that's where a bulk of its manufacturers and suppliers are located. And I bring that up just because of the rising tension, obviously, between the U.S. and China. Right. Xi'an has really tried to distance itself uh, pretty much there from regulators, from, from being associated more, uh, more to, uh, strictly, I should say, as a Chinese company. So again, you got to ask your question if if it is very, very close ties and that's viewed like that as an investor, how that is then going to potentially impact investor appetite as well. I left all my stuff in the cart for right now for my <laughs> Shein order. All right, we'll see how this plays out. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance, everyone. Novo Nordisk is a Danish multinational company that has built itself into a force in the weight loss industry and, by some accounts, created an obesity market out of thin air. The popularity of its blockbuster obesity drug Wagovi and diabetes drug Ozempic for weight loss was so great that it has been credited with propping up the entire economy of Denmark. It is that impact and buzz that led Yahoo Finance to name Novo Nordisk its 2023 Company of the Year. Novo's gross profit in 2023 was nearly $26 billion, or almost a 27% increase year over year. And the stock is on a tear, up more than 50% in the past year. The company began double-digit profit growth in 2020. So let's look at what started Novo's boom with Beyond the Ticker, where we take a closer look at some of the company's biggest moments. Novo's origins trace back to 1923, when Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium commercialized insulin that its founder brought over from Canada. Two years later, two employees broke away to form a rival Novo Therapeutics Laboratorium. Nearly five decades later is when Nordisk first established its presence in the United States and in 1985 launched the NovoPen, the first insulin pen device. Four years later, the two competing Nordisk and Novo entities merged to become the present-day giant, 
and the world's largest producer of insulin. The company finally shifted away from its reliance on insulin revenues in 2017, when the FDA approved Ozempic for diabetes and subsequently to treat obesity in diabetic patients in 2021. That was the same year Wagobi was approved for weight loss in obese or overweight adults without diabetes. These two products launched a new era in GLP-1s, which have been around since 2005. Since 2020, Novo has been on an acquisition spree, shelling out more than $7 billion on diabetes and obesity biotechs, fortifying its lead in the brand new obesity market. All right, let's rock. Fast food giants, they're serving up incentives to encourage franchisees to expand their business amid rising costs. But will these pricing incentives pay off? Brooke De Palma is here with the latest. Hey, Brooke, what do we know? Good morning, Brad. That's right. We heard a story of COVID closures during and post pandemic, and now it's really a story of growth. These major operators really looking to encourage franchisees to boost growth. But you can't help but think of the many challenges that are up against franchisee owners right now. That includes higher food costs, higher inflation costs, uh, higher labor inflation, that is. At the start of this year, we heard many states raise their minimum wage, more than 30, that is. And you also have that looming FAST Act in California come April 1st. Franchisees also facing higher interest rates, as well as increase in construction costs. It's 
up 3 to 35 percent compared to pre-pandemic. But now this is leading franchisees to be very cautious, very smart about just how much they want to develop post-pandemic. But brands are also looking to get in front of as many consumers as possible as they feel like there really is an opportunity in this sort of environment to ramp up growth for fast food and fast casual chains and, and really a need there that consumers want. So some of those investments, uh, incentives rather, that we're hearing from operators includes one out on Wednesday from Restaurant Brands International's subsidiary company called Firehouse Subs. So they announced a cash upfront incentive of $100,000 for up to three locations for new franchise operators that are either for former first responders or veterans. That's core to the Firehouse Subs brand. We also uh, heard from Mike Hancock, who's Firehouse Subs president, that since the company was acquired by Restaurant Brands International, they have been ramping up growth. That has been a key initiative for the company. And they're not alone in this initiative to really push and accelerate growth. We heard from Papa John's earlier this month that they're looking to boost North America and uh, development. They're waiving payments to the National Marketing Fund for up to five years for new stores built in 2024. And we also heard from Wendy's last year that they're also announcing an incentive. So this will be something to watch, just how much these play into growth. So, Brooke, I think a lot. the big question is, when does this make sense in terms of whether or not we're seeing a return, in terms of whether or not these incentives are the smartest way to go. What are some of the things that investors need to keep in mind? Yeah, it's, it's very early to tell, given that these incentives are just out. But uh, new store development will certainly be one to watch. Just how much uh, these work, just how many new stores are out this year. Also take a closer look at same source sales growth within the coming year to see just how much these new uh, operators are able to bring in new customers and really ramp up that, that ticket size based upon the franchisees renovating how they look, those new kiosks, those new snazzy ways that really companies are looking to intrigue customers to come in and ultimately spend more. And ultimately, it'll be up to that partnership between franchise operators and corporate brands. At the end of the day, these corporate brands, like say a McDonald's, a Restaurant Brands International, a Yum Brands, a Wendy's, a Papa John's, and so on, they really need to make sure that they're keeping up with their A-game, presenting the best marketing campaigns, menu innovation, attracting younger audience, and also keeping in touch and building strong relationships with food suppliers. And so it really is a two-way street here. It certainly is, and one that I'm sure you're going to be following as we try to figure out whether or not this is paying off. Well, Brooke, thanks so much. <laughs> All right, about 90 minutes here into the trading day. Again, you're still looking at gains across the board. You got the Dow up off the highs of the day, still up just about 39 points. That's all for us today. Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Akufo, they've got you covered for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's what we're watching this morning. Is Tesla losing charge? Despite Elon Musk hyping new products on the earnings call, results stunned Wall Street, with the EV maker delivering a soft quarter and a weak outlook. We'll break down what this means for the future of the EV maker. Investors also digesting the latest read on the U.S. economy. Fourth quarter GDP showing the economy grew at an annual pace of 3.3 percent, sending stocks higher. Plus, Apple taking the top spot for smartphone shipments in China for the first time as the country snaps its 10-quarter streak of sales declines. We've got the details coming up later this hour. But first, though, let's take a look at where markets are 90 minutes into the trading day on this Thursday. And you are seeing green arrows across the board. The Dow up 54 points, roughly. The S&P 500 up 16 and the Nasdaq up 70. As we mentioned, a lot of this in response to the economic data we got out this morning on GDP. Uh, let's also take a look at Treasury yields because we've seen some moves there uh, pulling back across the board on the yield curve here. The five year at 4.03% the 10 year at 413 and the 30 year yield at 437 but Rochelle in the markets today yes GDP but also another big corporate story we're watching Absolutely. Of course, this morning we're watching arguably the biggest story of the day, Tesla. And that stock extending its losses currently down almost 11 percent on the day after the company warned of slower growth in its latest quarterly results. And I'm really interested in Elon Musk's comments on Chinese competition. Let's listen to what he said. The Chinese car companies are the most competitive car companies in the world. Frankly, I think if, if, if they're not trade barriers established, they, they will pretty much demolish <laughs> most other car companies in the world. So when he's talking about competition from some of these Chinese cars, essentially, though, what he's talking about is some of these cheaper priced models and, and a bigger also a range of cars as well. Something that he had the opportunity to do. He had the opportunity to come up with a cheaper car. We're now seeing that potentially coming out in 2025 with this Redwood model. But this was really his crown to lose at this point. And he's actually very lucky at this point that there are those trade barriers that don't allow Chinese EVs to, to flood the U.S. as we're seeing that competition in the EU. Yeah, in many ways, Tesla has had what some would argue a first mover advantage for so long, right, in terms of having that brand as we've seen this shift to EVs. But now we're talking about this second phase, if you will, in the transition. And to your point, the Chinese makers really, really giving Tesla a run for its money. And the question here is, when they start to expand beyond their home market of China, how does Tesla go head to head, especially with that pricing? Yesterday, we were talking about that $25,000 car that Tesla is potentially looking into uh, moving forward here because that cycle of Model Ys and Model 3s, Elon Musk essentially said yesterday, things are starting to stall out on that front. What I think is kind of interesting is looking at Tesla's stock move. We have seen it just get battered on the back of those results yesterday after hours today, extending those losses down about 10.7 percent. And Rochelle, the question, this has been the ongoing question for Tesla. Is it a car company? Is it a tech play? And to me, what's interesting is so many analysts that have come out before any of the earnings calls to say this is a tech company, this is an AI robotics company. And yet, when you look at this reaction today, it, it clearly still, in a significant way, trades on the car side of things because the AI robotics side simply isn't there. The product isn't there. Elon Musk has all but admitted they are not leading on that. So then what happens to the price of the stock? I mean, today it is a direct reaction, but you have to wonder long term here what that looks like. Um, Adam Jonas put out a note initially before the earnings call, which I thought was kind of interesting, breaking down what he thinks is sort of the price, the value of this stock at three hundred forty dollars, five dollars a share, which is where he thinks it should be. He thinks Tesla shares worth only seventy five dollars comes from selling electric vehicles. So. A bit of a surprising move, you could argue, if that's the breakdown. I mean, not everybody in the market believes that, but this is still moving on the auto side because the AI and robotics bet is still ways ahead.
No, I mean, and, and you raise a good point there. I, I did think it was interesting in that same note uh, from Jonas. He said that he didn't think that the Tesla, that the, the 4Q earnings result and the earnings call didn't move the narrative in either direction, but it was the fact that he didn't, we didn't hear much about anything to alleviate the bearishness. So it's sort of letting that narrative run continues to fuel this potential negativity. We're already seeing a slowdown in the EV space. So if you wanted to hear some good news, obviously that's not what Musk does. He's, he's going to tell it how it is. But that's clearly not what investors were looking for, especially as they see him continue to be distracted by making X the everything app. They really did want to see some signs of growth here and really not getting it. Yes, yeah, simply uh, really a lot to parse through in terms of what the valuation of the stock should be. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from Wall Street on that front. Well, the U.S. economy remains red hot. Fourth quarter GDP came in hotter than expected, growing at an annualized rate of 3.3 percent versus the 2 percent that was expected. We've got Michelle Gerard, NatWest Global Economics head of U.S. Uh, Michelle, let me get your reaction to the number that we got today and to what extent this alleviates some of those recession concerns. Well, I, again, another report that beat expectations, beat our own expectations. Uh, you know, we had thought we'd be closer to one and a half percent. I think in particular, more good news about the consumer here. I mean, it wasn't just uh, uh, it wasn't just a component like, for example, the fact we had a smaller drawdown in inventories. Um, inventories, we're expected to be a drag on the number. They're up. It, 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 if you look at some of these, uh, some of the numbers, particularly, as I said, the strength of the beat on the consumer side, it su- continues to suggest ongoing resilience. And, and coupled with that, though, uh, good news on inflation. The inflation numbers were in line or or perhaps even slightly lower than expected. So for markets, a great combination where you're still seeing economic resilience, but but not the inflation pressures. And, and so, you, you, you know, you, you've got almost a, a best of, of all worlds or a Goldilocks type of scenario with these numbers. So, Michelle, what do you think will be the turning point? Obviously, the, the consumer's not going to keep spending spending forever. They've right. blown through all their pandemic savings and s- still seeing that credit card debt continuing to mount up. What do you think is going to be the turning point here? Oh, I wish I knew, because I have to say, we have been very skeptical about the ongoing strength of the consumer and, and the broader economy for to be honest, far too long, we actually thought we might be already in a recession and the data as reported just continued to come in stronger, whether we're talking about GDP or the retail sales figures or, you know, just it seems like report after report, the numbers look stronger, despite, as you have noted, some cracks that are appearing, I think, in the um, in, in some of the more anecdotal uh, or survey evidence or, or evidence of delinquency rates ticking up. Uh, you know, I, I think this morning we saw more evidence with um, with the surveys of, of regional uh, manufacturing activity coming down, you know, being weaker. Beige Book has, has cited problems. And I even think in the employment report that looked healthier, the underlying news in that report from last month was not as strong as it appears. So I think the consumer is going to continue to be to be pressured. As you said, savings are gone. They've, they've benefited from, um, from real earnings, inflation-adjusted earnings being higher. But as the labor market loosens, as companies, I think, pull back on hiring and some of that strength sort of dissipates, I do think you're going to see a, you know, a softer um, consumer and overall economy. We do think we'll be in a recession by the middle of 2024. So, Michelle, with all those factors you just mentioned, how much support do you think the U.S. economy needs in the form of monetary policy to keep this kind of momentum going? Are we talking about two rate cuts, three rate cuts? I mean, how do you sort of break that down? So, you know, the market is looking for, um, you know, a lot of rate cuts to begin Maybe March, I think some of that expectation now has been pushed off a bit. Um, but but the market is looking for, for the Fed to cut rates five times or more in, in 2024. With our recession forecast, we actually think the Fed could be more aggressive than that, um, cutting perhaps twice as much, getting the funds rate back down to three or three and a quarter percent. And and it's really not so much about the Fed needing to to step on the gas, if you will, to try to help the economy, because again, the economy is showing resilience. It's really more about with inflation basically kind of at or getting back very close to target. We think it's going to be back to two percent by the by the spring. Do you really need the funds rate to be up 
at five and a half percent to be so jammed on on the brakes. And so it's really more about the argument for when does the Fed feel they should start to take their foot off the brake to give the Fed, the economy rather, a little bit uh, more ability, you know, less of a strong headwind to continue to to grow and and hopefully, uh, you know, again, avoid a recession. And so. Uh, Michelle, you know, we have gotten a string of uh, announcements this week uh, coming in, particularly out of tech companies, of additional layoffs. What we've been trying to figure out is how much of this is specific to tech about this massive buildup in hiring they saw during the pandemic. How much of this is a sign of things to come? How are you looking yes, at it? Yes, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that I think that there's a broader weakening in the labor market beyond just tech. Uh, you know, I referenced the fact that in the uh, December employment report, where the headline looked pretty good, there were some worrisome signs in the in the more detailed data. Uh, I also, on that same day, we had an anecdotal survey of. Uh, non-manufacturing industries or, or companies. And and in that report, we saw a big hit to uh, the number of companies saying that they were going to be hiring workers and the employment, um, you know, kind of the employment there. And so I do think there is evidence that we're seeing more caution on the part of cons- uh, of companies to be hiring. And I, I, I do think that the employment data themselves are going to, at those headline numbers, are going to start to weaken. And it's that kind of fundamental um, continuing easing of labor market conditions that will ultimately probably undermine the consumer. And of course, Michelle, you know, U.S. economy not operating in a silo here. So as we look at what other central banks are doing, especially the ECB Mm -hmm. in their conversations, they, they weren't even thinking about a rate cut. How should we be viewing some of these external issues and how that affects the moves that the Fed could be making? Well, I think what we're seeing globally is that all central banks are starting to, well, the major central banks are uh, shifting from tightening through much of 2023 to easing in 2024. And the question is how much and when. The ECB was kind of widely expected to be the first ones to cut. Uh, Markets were pricing um, in cuts as, as soon as March. The last few weeks, the ACB has really, I think, pushed back against that. But this morning, they left rates unchanged as expected. But the press conference was a little bit more dovish and seemed to perhaps open the door for rate cuts in March or in April. at At this point, we're still expecting that it may, or I think we assign highest probability, I would say, to the rate cuts maybe not starting till the summer, although we acknowledge it could come earlier, um, and then and then maybe more aggressively, a 50 basis point cut rather than 25. But but I think what we're going to be seeing is all central banks, whether it's the you know ECB, BOE, or the Fed, are this year going to be looking from moving policy from very restrictive, a very restrictive stance with interest rates well above their so-called neutral level to to now with inflation more in check, coming back, you know, lowering those rates back at least to a level where they're not they're not hurting the economy or hindering the economy, nor nor boosting it. Certainly a balancing act there. They're all continuing to try and follow. Exactly. Appreciate you taking the time for joining us, Michelle. Thanks so much. Nat West, Global Economics Head of US. Thank you. All right, well, now let's take a look at some trending tickers. We have our eyes on healthcare stocks today. Humana is the culprit driving all of those stocks lower. The company slashed its four-year guidance, saying it's seeing a widening loss in the fourth quarter and signaling more trouble in 2024 all driven by heightened medical costs. Now, we heard this from United Healthcare earlier in the year as well. And it's true, Akiko, they talked about the the Medicare side of the business, you know, coming in more than expected. A lot of this this pent-up demand that people had when they put off some of those procedures and and outpatient um, treatments during COVID starting to pile up all at the same time here, as we heard from United Healthcare. Yeah, and Humana also warned about these costs. So you could argue it wasn't entirely surprised investors, although the loss is much more, uh, much steeper than expected. Um, they do uh, have a huge exposure, particularly around Medicare, because that makes up a bulk of their business. So uh, certainly um, something that is not just particular to Humana, but especially exposed um, given uh, how their business makeup is. Well, coming up, the hottest debate on Wall Street. 
That's right, the timing of the Federal Reserve's interest rate cut. We're going to discuss why this earnings season is playing a bigger role in the Fed's rate decision than investors think. That's coming up next. The hottest debate on Wall Street is when the Federal Reserve will start to cut interest rates. Talks about the Fed's potential timeline for rate cuts have been a driving factor to the market's momentum in the last few weeks. But while the market may have gotten ahead of itself by pricing in the full impact of a possible rate cut decision, our next guest believes that what matters most to the Fed now is earnings season. Let's bring in James Liu, Clear Clearnomics founder and chief executive officer to weigh in. Thank you for joining us this morning. So, James, how much of an impact will earnings season play into the Fed's decision to cut rates? Because that's not usually something that the Fed tends to pay attention to. They sort of like to cool markets' expectations. Yeah, Rochelle, it's great to chat with you. Basically, when you look at the debate right now in the market, it's no longer about whether or not a soft landing is going to happen. It's really a question about how soft it's going to be. And so that debate about whether it's going to be March or May, you know, whether it's going to be three cuts this year, five cuts, that depends on the strength, of course, on the underlying economy. And so when you look at the overall market performance last year and that fantastic 26% return we had for the S&P, that was not driven by earnings per se, because we basically had flat earnings uh, across 2023. That was all valuations. And so what will have to happen next in the story for both the market and the Fed is that we need to start seeing corporations start to perform better in terms of earnings. And so a lot is priced in right now. 
the market right now expects about 10% earnings growth for the next year. And if we see that earnings growth, that will justify both the valuations, but it could potentially also give the Fed confidence that the underlying economy actually is quite strong, that business investment is happening, and that they are on a trajectory where they can start to cut rates in the middle of the year. And based on the results we got so far, James, are you seeing that? Well, Akiko, it's a little bit too early to tell. So we're early in the Q4 earnings season. It looks like earnings are going to come in slightly negative on a quarter over quarter basis. But the key here, if you take a step back, is that we had an inflection point in the third quarter of last year, where earnings went from this earnings recessionary period to an uptick. And so if you take a look at 2024, that's really what investors are looking forward to right now. The goal has to be that we see roughly 10% earnings growth, which is quite a bit. A lot of expectations are built into this, but of course, that's already reflected in valuations as well. So really, it's earnings growth in 2024 that will drive whether or not the soft landing is as soft as people hope for. And James, obviously, this is a very different period that we're entering into. We've had, you know, a history of, of low interest rates here from the Fed. How should investors be thinking about this period if they're trying to jump into the market, but knowing that we really are in a transitional stage at the moment? Yeah, so that transition really is happening right now. And in fact, we're slightly past it, right? So if you think about that big tsunami of inflation that happened the last couple of years, really, we're past that period now. Now, the debate is not whether or not inflation will come down or get back to, quote, quote, more historical normal levels. The question is how quickly and when will we get back to that two, two and a half percent inflation rate that the Fed wants? And you know, based on the glide paths that we're seeing, that could happen in the second half of this year. So if you're an investor that has basically been planning your portfolio strategy around the last two years, where you had that bear market in 2022 and sort of a stabilization and rebound in 2023, the next two years with Fed rate cuts will likely look very, very different. It does not mean the market will go straight up. You're going to see a lot of volatility as that happens. You know, remember the Magnificent Seven that everyone's talking about? They did very well last year, but they also lost half their value in 2022. So it's really this rocky ride. So what matters going back to earnings is that corporations start to perform better. That justifies a lot of the valuations we're seeing. And hopefully because of that, you start seeing a broadening out of performance across the market, across sectors, and not just in areas like tech. And James, I see a big warning in your note that says the consumer slowdown is coming. You could argue that warning has already been, uh, you know, sort of message from some of these companies we've heard from uh, in the earnings season so far. Lower volume, consumers pulling back on discretionary spending. With that in mind, what are the names you think that investors should be getting out of in the anticipation of this slowdown accelerating? How do investors look at their portfolio? Well, Kiko, you're right. We're in this interesting transition period where the backward-looking data, like today's GDP report, still show very strong consumer spending. The retail sales numbers we got a few weeks ago show the same thing. And yet, when you look at what companies are experiencing, they are already anticipating the slowdown and feeling a lot of that. And so areas like consumer discretionary and consumer staples, those sectors, those should actually start to slow down if that continues to play out because excess savings are being spent and consumer spending starts to decline. However, if you look at areas like industrials and financials, they could potentially benefit from not just rate cuts, but also a re-steepening of the yield curve as we get to back to a quote, quote unquote more normal environment. And if you start to see business investment actually start to pick up and stabilize, that could help areas like manufacturing, industrials, and those sectors. So again, the hope is that if last year was very much driven by the Magnificent Seven and technology-related sectors, that that performance will broaden out. Consumer discretionary, consumer staples will likely see a bit more of a headwind, but areas like industrials, financials, hopefully those start to benefit in the coming year. So, of course, with, with the Fed in mind and with margins and earnings in mind, and of course, we are in an election year. And, and you say that elections are less impactful than many investors believe. Why is that? And at, at what point do markets start to care? Right. So that's a great question, Rochelle. So, of course, elections are important, you know, as voters, taxpayers, as citizens, very, very important. But from a market's perspective, it's really a different story. It is not the case that when one political party gets in the power, either White House or Congress, that you have a market collapse. You know, there's so many stories around this where investors were fearful of this over the last 20 years. 
and it didn't happen. In fact, you tend to have markets rising in all these periods once the political situation stabilizes. And so from an investment standpoint, of course, policy can affect specific sectors, specific companies. That's very important. You know, there's taxes and trade policy. But from the broadest perspective of the everyday investor, let's not overreact for, from our portfolios when it comes to the presidential election this year. Of course, it matters as voters and citizens again, but let's not overreact when it comes to how we allocate our money. James Liu, Clearnomics founder and chief executive officer. Always good to get your insights. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for having me on. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Novo Nordisk is a Danish multinational company that has built itself into a force in the weight loss industry and, by some accounts, created an obesity market out of thin air. The popularity of its blockbuster obesity drug Wagovi and diabetes drug Ozempic for weight loss was so great that it has been credited with propping up the entire economy of Denmark. It is that impact and buzz that led Yahoo Finance to name Novo Nordisk its 2023 Company of the Year. Novo's gross profit in 2023 was nearly $26 billion, or almost a 27% increase year over year. And the stock is on a tear, up more than 50% in the past year. The company began double-digit profit growth in 2020. So let's look at what started Novo's boom with Beyond the Ticker, where we take a closer look at some of the company's biggest moments. Novo's origins trace back to 1923, when Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium commercialized insulin that its founder brought over from Canada. Two years later, two employees broke away to form a rival Novo Therapeutics Laboratorium. Nearly five decades later is when Nordisk first established its presence in the United States and in 1985 launched the NovoPen, the first insulin pen device. Four years later, the two competing Nordisk and Novo entities merged to become the present-day giant and the world's largest producer of insulin. The company finally shifted away from its reliance on insulin revenues in 2017, when the FDA approved Ozempic for diabetes and subsequently to treat obesity in diabetic patients in 2021. That was the same year Wagobi was approved for weight loss in obese or overweight adults without diabetes. These two products launched a new era in GLP-1s, which have been around since 2005. Since 2020, Novo has been on an acquisition spree, shelling out more than $7 billion on diabetes and obesity biotechs, fortifying its lead in the brand new obesity market.
GLP-1s, commonly known as obesity drugs, are sweeping the U.S. and were anticipated to ruin a number of sectors by changing consumer trends. But that really may not be the case. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani to dig into the healthcare space. We also have Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma to tell us what she's been seeing in the fast food space. Anj, take it away. That's right, Akiko. I attended the healthcare conference hosted by JPM earlier this year, and it was interesting to see how much of a topic it was and wasn't in some sectors. We know that, of course, the pharma sector is looking to get a boost from the specifically Novo uh, Nordisk and Eli Lilly, but then there are other parts of the healthcare sector that could have been severely impacted. That includes med tech devices, those that are glucose monitoring devices, for example, uh, you know, analysts predicting less of a need for it, as well as surgery such as bariatric as a result of the popularity of these weight loss drugs. But we, we have found out is that instead, we have actually seen uh, maybe a, a balancing out or rather a, a boost in some areas of that. Uh, we had JPM, anal JPM analysts talking about that after the conference saying, quote, thankfully, what we didn't hear was mention of GLP-1s. That bubble of fear and panic seems to have burst for the most part. And that fear and uh, panic that they were referring to came from a different analyst note in mid-October that talked about the impact that it could have on all these other areas and other consumer trends. And so what we have seen instead is quite a shift away. And there are other sectors that could have been impacted. I know, Brooke, you have also seen some of that action. Yeah, that's right, Anjali. Earlier this month, I attended the ICR conference. Now, at this conference, there are many mid to large size consumer facing companies, and they all waited on the state of the industry. But one topic that was missing at this conference for most conversations was the GLP-1 impact. And that sort of seems to be part of a larger trend that we're following right now. And a note to clients, TD Cowan analyst Andrew Charles credits a cooling GLP-1 narrative for fast food and fast casual chains valuation rebound from its six-month lows. Now, that's in addition also to slowing interest rates, and we're also seeing greater investor optimism for 2024 consumer spending estimates. But if you take a closer look at six-month chart shares of Domino's as well as Papa John's, you also following Yum! Brands, McDonald's, Restaurant Brands International, you could see this dip in mid-October to early November and that rebound. Now, that dip was largely driven by those investor fears that these weight loss drugs would ultimately completely change consumer behavior, the way they eat, through how frequently they go. And at the conference, industry veteran Charlie Morrison, who's the former CEO of Wingstop and now serves as CEO of Salad & Go, a new venture he has, he said that this further proves his business model. He also said that accessibility to these drugs is really difficult, especially for the lower income consumer. And that business model that he currently has is lower price, approximately $7 salads. And he also said that should people on these drugs want a healthier alternative, that will also boost the business. And as you can see, McDonald's right here, slightly flat today. But we also heard from the CEO of McDonald's, Krips Kanchensky, late last year, that they really aren't seeing any impact this year, or rather end of last year. And they're unsure of what exactly the future holds but maybe that impact wasn't as big as they once feared, Anjali. That's right. And we also know that what remains to be seen includes the uptake of these drugs in addition to accessibility, the side effects, a really big topic of conversation as more competition is down the pike for Novo and Lilly with these drugs. In addition, they're looking at uh, production constraints still for some of the drugs. So all put together, whether or not this is a long-term fear that could still be on the books or whether or not the, the storm has passed is what we are waiting to see. Akiko? Yeah, Angela, I know you've been asking that question for some time, you know, how much runway this has. So certainly something I know you and Brooke will both be watching. Angela Kamlani and Brooke De Palma, thanks so much for that. Well, welcome sign of recovering the world's largest smartphone market. New data from Counterpoint Research this morning shows handset sales in China grew for the first time in two years in the fourth quarter. Sales grew 6.6% year on year. Apple retained its leadership, capturing 20% of the market. Meanwhile, the tech giant led the market in smartphone shipments for the first, the first time in 2023, beating out Chinese rivals Huawei, 
Oppo and Vivo. That's according to IDC. And Rochelle, worth pointing out that last part about Apple main, taking that lead in the Chinese market. We're talking about shipments. So this is the number of devices that Apple sells to third party sellers. It's not sales per se, but that's got to be a promising sign at a time when we've heard of a number of headwinds for the company, whether it is about government agencies looking to ban Apple phones, whether it's about consumers really pulling back on more of the high end products. Um, certainly a promising thing for Apple. But one more thing to note here, Huawei re-entering the top five in terms of shipments there. That's going to be an interesting competition to watch between Apple and Huawei. It is. And we know that Huawei was iced out of, of, out of a lot of Western markets and then really went into developing its own chips. So it's interesting to see that rise there as it's coming back up, nipping at Apple's heels. Um, it was interesting to see that Apple sales declining less than those Chinese homegrown brands, sort of the, the best of a bunch that was sort of struggling when it comes to consumer demand and, you know, less disposable income. And, and seeing that we've really seen China smartphone shipments falling about 5% compared to 2022, the lowest volume in a decade, because this economic recovery didn't happen. We're still waiting for that to happen, still waiting for consumers to really open their purse strings. So interesting to see Apple still nudging ahead here, despite the tough news that it's been having, obviously with a lot of its products, including some of its watches and other things, but that, that iPhone, really that, that hero product for, for Apple. Well, and also worth noting that we talk about Apple in China so much because Apple does get a significant chunk of their revenue, roughly 20 percent in the Chinese market. So any sign of a recovery, there, certainly good news. And the fact that they are now number one in shipments, something that uh, Apple can uh, tout in their upcoming earnings. It's true. And it was interesting in that IDC note, um, Arthur Gao, the analyst there, saying that it wasn't just a, a question of demand, but also some timely promotions as well. So timing also working in Apple's favor there as well. All right. We have all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Thank you. 
Generative AI is the craze of the moment, but there's no shortage of potential roadblocks for the rapidly expanding industry. The legal questions surrounding the use of this technology are a big one. For large language models to think like a human being, they need lots and lots of information. A landmark case brought by the New York Times against OpenAI and Microsoft for copyright infringement could be just the tip of the iceberg. How is copyright law interpreted and applied there? Will it stifle growth or will AI innovation be limited only to the companies with the finances to fight lawsuits or license a ton of data. We explore one of the biggest battlegrounds on the AI landscape. Well, a wave of artificial intelligence lawsuits are starting to pile up in America's courtrooms. And one of those wider known lawsuits was filed last month, just days before heading into 2024. The New York Times sued Microsoft and OpenAI, the startup behind ChatGPT, over copyright infringement. The paper alleging millions of its articles were used to train AI programs and wants the companies to be held accountable for, quote, billions of dollars in statutory and actual damages. So could lawsuits like this rewrite the rules of AI? For more on how copyright law could threaten the AI industry is Ryan Abbott, LLP partner at Brown, Neri Smith and Khan. Thank you for joining us this morning. So I want to first draw the distinction between the copyright issues and the patent issues and really the questions that, that are being raised and not being covered by existing law. No, thanks so much for having me. Well, you know, what we're fundamentally seeing is this new sort of activity where you have machines that are behaving like people and legal systems that were designed with human-centric concepts. And so in the patent context, for example, we're asking if a company like Nova Nordisk uses AI to develop Wegovi or Ozempic, can they patent something like that? Or do you need a traditional human inventor? And this may be an issue where you have tech companies licensing drug discovery models to big pharma companies and the people using the models don't really know how they work or how the output is validated, but it's generating useful output. And so this really questions some fundamental tenets of our IP system. In copyright, you have similar sorts of concerns. So one is if you're using something like mid-journey or stable diffusion, and you say, I'd like a graphic for Yahoo Finance, and it gives you a piece of artwork, whether you could copyright that or Yahoo can copyright that. And those, that case, uh, the New York Times case, is, is one of many that have been brought recently against AI developers. And that case is, is alleging a number of things, but one of them is that it is copyright infringement to train AI models on copyright-protected content without permission. So open AI for their large language models uses massive amounts of data that they've scraped from the internet it would be, they allege, impossible or impractical to license that information because there's so many parties that there would be holdouts and the cost would be impractical. Um, and in the U.S., it's an open question right now whether that is permitted under copyright law, whether it is infringement or permissible under a standard we call fair use, uh, because there are a lot of exceptions to copyright infringement, for yeah. example, a human being training on information. Uh, Ryan, let, let's hone in on the part about patents, uh, because you did testify before Congress and you've called for sort of an overhaul of the current patent law in place. You take that first example you just had about a pharmaceutical company developing a product with the assistance of AI or utilizing AI. What does current law say about who owns the patent and how does that need to change? Sure. Well, right now, most inventors don't own their patents. So Nova Nordisk may, you know, employ large teams of research scientists. At the end of the day, the company will generally own that patent. And it is not uncommon in drug discovery to have collaborations between multiple companies, and they'll work out who owns it by contract, and that can be kind of complicated. When an AI gets involved, it gets potentially a little bit trickier as you're asking, you know, who is the inventor? Because we need an inventor to have someone own a patent. The right goes to the inventor. And then it goes to who they've assigned the invention to or who's entitled to it. And you could potentially have a lot of people doing complex things in this scenario. Again, someone can be building a drug discovery model. Someone can be training it on a particular data set. Someone can be using it to generate output. Someone else could be validating the output. And there really isn't law right now on, well, who in that is the inventor? And it can make a big difference to ownership if those individuals are at different companies, you know, especially if they don't have contracts in place or if there's open source models. But right now the law is, and this is recent as of last year, 
Uh, if you don't have someone that you can say that person made an inventive contribution, you can't get a patent right now. And some companies like Siemens have reported that they've been unable to apply for patent applications where human beings involved in this process have said, I didn't do anything inventive. This is just AI output. And it was obviously valuable and I'm not an inventor. So as AI does more and more in R&D the way it's doing right now in the creative industry, mm -hmm. this is an increasing risk for businesses that use AI in R&D. So, so Ryan, let's say that the law is changed so that a company or individual that owns the AI system can, in fact, own the patent for any inventions that come through the system. To what extent does that stifle um, innovation, particularly around the smaller players, because the argument is that the bigger companies that are out there can fight some of these lawsuits. That's not necessarily the case for some other players. Sure. Well, you know, it's hard to say how this is going to develop. In the creative industry, to, to a certain extent, the release of these powerful AI models has really helped to democratize creativity. So I have very little creative skill, but if I wanted to make a graphic novel or even a short film, I could use generative AI platforms to help me do something that in the past, you know, realistically only a music or a movie studio could produce. So it may be that the release of, you know, more powerful AI models does return some power to SMEs that are looking to innovate. But on the theory that it we have further industry consolidation and there's, you know, a few large pharma companies and a few large tech companies that are driving a lot of AI enabled innovation. Uh, fundamentally, I think that would still be a pretty good social outcome because, you know, you would have then Pfizer and GSK turning out new drugs, reducing the pipeline for validating those drugs work, you know, resulting in everyone getting a lot more socially valuable innovation, which is really what the system's designed to do. And, and it's something where large players do have an advantage right now, including because they can afford the cost of prosecuting patents and litigating them, which could be quite costly. And Ryan, how do you quantify harm in this situation? I know for Anthropic, one of their defenses was that the, the, they were looking for, for their accuser to, to show harm. But say you repurpose a picture, you've used AI to generate an image or a product. How do you end up quantifying harm if perhaps they're not making a profit off of it? How, how does that end up playing out? Sure. Well, copyright law is different in every jurisdiction. In the United States, there are statutory damages for copyright infringement and for willful infringement. So someone, you know, essentially knew something was protected by copyright and just didn't care and went ahead with it. You have six figure statutory damages. So <clears throat> you, you don't need in those instances to prove actual harm. And depending on how you're calculating times of infringement, you know, potentially the damages could be astronomical. You know, this was an issue in the um, Google Books cases where Google was digitizing libraries and, you know, Authors Guild and other entities alleged that that was infringement and there were potentially at least billions of dollars of damages on the table. Ultimately, the courts decided that that was fair use. Um, you know, alternately, one can seek actual damages and that does generally require that one is being deprived of some sort of commercial opportunity. So for individuals, who aren't commercially artists but have a moral objection to their works being trained on AI systems, and there are a number of, of such individuals, uh, they generally be seeking statutory damages. It's a, it's a fascinating, very convoluted process that's likely to play out here um, in the months and years ahead. Ryan Abbott, LLP partner at Brown Neri Smith Con. Really great to have you on today. Thanks so much. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Recent housing data showing three pieces of good news for renters today. First rent prices cooling in December, down about $4 from November, according to Realtor.com. Second, more inventory is coming. The U.S. Census Bureau says nearly a million multifamily units are under construction and set to open in the next 12 months. And finally, more landlords are trying to sweeten the deal. Over 30 percent of rental listings are offering concessions like a month of free parking, free or free rent or a parking space. That's according to Zillow. Um, the one I liked, Rochelle, free gym membership. That's pretty nice, right? I mean, either way, it's good news for so many Americans who have felt squeezed on both ends with high rents and then also not being able to move to a new home because that's equally expensive. I will say, I like the idea of the gym perk, whether I'd actually use it is a whole other story. But it's one of those things that's at least nice to have yeah. versus feeling like you're sort of over a bowel trying to find a space because, you know, vacancies are low. But now we're seeing vacancies picking up. So now that these landlords can sweeten the deal. And it's interesting in the rent versus buy debate, um, the economist at Realtor.com saying that the math should continue to favor renters, at least in the short term. So a little, a little bit of relief here obviously d depends on where you are, but some relief here, at least for the renters out there. Well, of course, staying in the rental market lane, we're looking at a new Realtor.com report that came out today revealing nationwide rents are down year over year. But renters beware, prices are up as much as 6% in certain locations. To break down where the deals and discrepancies are, we have Danielle Hale, Realtor.com chief economist. Thank you for joining us this morning. So for a lot of people wondering in that, in that rent versus buy debate, we've seen nationwide some of these prices ticking down, but some of these, these sticklers here, especially if you look at locations like Boston highlighted and New York as well. Why are we still seeing those sticking? Yeah, so the nationwide trend is toward rent softening. And we've seen that fairly consistently over the last eight months. Rents have declined on a year-over-year -year basis. We're not talking about huge declines nationwide. In December, the figure was down just 0.4%. And the reason for that is that it depends on where renters are. They're going to see slightly different trends on the ground. So if you're in major cities on the Northeast, for example, you highlighted New York and Boston, rents are still going up in those areas on a 6% year-over-year -year basis. But in parts of the South and in the West, we're seeing rents decline. So depending on where a renter is, they're going to see slightly different market trends. Nationwide, we're looking at rough stability, which is a nice change from the double digit gains that we had seen in rents in 2022. So it's giving renters pocketbooks and incomes a chance to catch up. Danielle, what kind of knock-on effect is that likely to have on the housing market? You know, so much of the discussion has been sort of the, the mobility or the lack of mobility with Americans kind of stuck with where they were because they couldn't move to a new rental property. Rents were too high. They couldn't necessarily move to a new home because they couldn't buy. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see this free up options for people. And we talked about this in our housing forecast, that even though we expect to see inventory remain relatively low, prices could soften because <clears throat> renters will have more options. And you talked about this in the prior segment that we see uh, the number of multifamily rental units that are under construction right now, very close to a record high. So there's a lot of supply in the pipeline. So we expect to see this softening trend continue. And that's going to give renters incomes a chance to catch up. But it, it, again, it really depends on where you are. We see more construction in the South, uh, we've also seen a little bit more in the Midwest, um, but demand has held up better in the Midwest. So we see these different price trends. And again, it, it really matters where you are. And so renters want to pay attention to the local trends. I think it's also worth noting that we're tracking asking rents of listings that are listed for rent on Realtor.com. So these are landlords who don't have someone in their home that are trying to get the home rented or big communities that are trying to get the home rented. But for renters who are staying in place, uh, they might be seeing very different trends. And we know that market rents up until the last year have tended to outpace uh, those rents changes for renters that are staying in one place. Uh, so right now, mm -hmm. people who have stayed in one place might actually see their rents increase a little bit more than what we're seeing uh, in other areas. So it might pay to look around if you haven't in a while. And Daniel, just very quickly, we have about, about 30 seconds here. The types of units that people can get the best deal on, whether it's studio, zero, zero to two bedroom, where are the best deals being found there in terms of the types of units? Yeah, so it really depends on the market. In some areas, you're seeing studios do better. In other areas, two bedrooms do better. Um, but on the whole, we are seeing breaks generally across the board. Uh, so I think whatever size unit you're looking for, you are likely to find uh, softening rents at the nationwide level. And then again, the trends on the ground are going to differ depending on where you are. 
Certainly, at least some well, deals to be had, but Danielle obviously do. Oh, obviously making sure that uh, everyone does their homework there as they're looking for those rents. Danielle Hale, Realtor.com Chief Economist. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching. We're seeing markets green across the board as we head into the noon hour. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.